Cindy, will you let me know when uh, when we're ready? We are ready to go, Mr. Mayor. Okay, very good. Uh, this is uh, St. Helena Mayor Jeff Ellsworth welcoming folks to the City of St. Helena regular City Council meeting Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. I'm going to ask our assistant to the city manager, Priya Nixon, to read a statement regarding our, our new capacity for a Spanish interpretation of the meeting. Thank you, Mayor Ellsworth. Good evening. Just wanted to let everyone know that tonight's meeting will have live Spanish interpretation. To access this, this interpretation, you will need to use the Zoom application. You can use that from your cell phone, your tablet, or your computer. We have instructions on how to use the Zoom app in Spanish and English located on the city's website um, where the agenda is posted. And then once you join the meeting at the bottom or top of the screen, you will see a little globe and you click on the globe and you can access the Spanish interpretation. Thank you. And now I'll read a, a paragraph um, uh, regarding our remote meetings in accordance with executive order N-29-20 and guidance from the California Department of Public Health and Gatherings, remote public participation is allowed. We will address the order in the following ways. Members of the public may not physically attend meetings. The city council meeting will be live streamed on Comcast channel 28 and on the city's website, barring technical difficulties. Those members of the public wishing to participate must do so remotely via Zoom electronic meetings in the following ways, by either logging onto the Zoom link located on the meeting agenda, please download the app to your computer or mobile device and enter the meeting ID, or by calling a listed number and enter the meeting ID. Public comment for city council meetings will be accepted via email to publiccomment at cityofsthelena.org. All public comments must be emailed by 4 p.m. For, uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, email public comments will not be read out loud, but will be publicly available and attached to the online city council agenda. Uh, and uh, Priya is uh, just went over the Spanish language. Um, and is there anything else that we need to highlight on public participation? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much, Mayor Ellsworth. I'm going to share my screen again and show a different screen. So for those who want to participate only by the telephone, um, what you're going to do during public comment is dial 669-900-6833. And then at the prompt, you're going to enter in 895-9037-5822 and press pound. And then when the mayor calls for public comment, you'll press star nine. Um, if you're using a phone, sometimes you also have to press star six to unmute yourself. And that's how you can participate via the phone. For those who are joining via the Zoom app, you can use the raise hand feature. If you're on an iPad, it's at the top of the screen. If you are joining from a computer, it's at the bottom of the screen. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll now move to our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, of Allegiance. I've asked our uh, Police Chief, Chief Hartley, to lead us in the pledge. Please follow me by placing your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to our roll call, please. Mayor Ellsworth? Here. Vice Mayor Doring? Here. Here. Hoberstein? Here. Present. Okay, very good. Now we're gonna to move to our public forum. Uh, before we get started with that, I just wanna take a moment, remind folks that we're, you know, we're still in recovery phases. Everybody's been uh, uh, patient and working well together as we move uh, you know, past these fires into the recovery phases. I'm just going to put out a few little bit of information. There's a local assistance center that's at the Presbyterian Church in St. Helena. That's at 1428 Spring Street for anybody who needs assistance uh, in any realm uh, related to these fires. So that's at the St. Helena Presbyterian Church, 1428 Spring Street. Uh, you can also go to the readynapacounty.org website 
uh, for information about resources and services. So that's readynapacounty.org. And uh, community donations are still always very important. And folks can go to the Napa Valley Community Foundation at NapaValleyCF.org uh, to, to help in that way. So I just wanna uh, thank everybody again for the patience and the hard work through these emergency efforts. Um, and uh, we'll move now into public comment and take comments from the public. Uh, this is where uh, members of the public are entitled to speak on matters of municipal concern, not on the agenda. And each person's comments shall be limited to four minutes, please. Uh, are there any uh, public comment uh, folks there for public comment at this point? Yes, we do have folks here for public comment. Um, I'm going to unmute uh, last name Durvin and um, please state your full name and you should be able to unmute yourself and speak and I will start my clock. Good evening, it's Nancy Durvin. I just wanted to say <clears throat> it's exciting to learn that the Association of Bay Area Governments will most likely be directing St. Helena to add 171 new housing units between 2023 and 2031. It's exciting because a mandate can help us cut through some of the resistance that it has been clogging things up. And thank heavens we have the Adams Street property. For those who may not be aware, in 2015, Bernaza Wolf Associates conducted a feasibility analysis and comparison of sites for new affordable housing development in St. Helena. And the Adams Street property was ranked number one and was highly recommended as the best possible site for rental housing. And that hasn't changed. In reviewing the history of Adams Street, I can't help but wonder why the city didn't follow through with the visioning that was done and paid for in 2009 under the guidance of planning and design firm MIG. Had the city followed through, we could have had at least 28 housing units with parking and an additional 99 parking spaces for community use on Adams Street right now, among other community serving installations. Those 99 parking spaces would have gone a long way in support of our downtown area where lack of parking has been identified as a major and critical problem. Not to mention the overall benefit to the entire community in having more working families comfortably housed right here in town. Instead, three years ago, a whole new visioning process was launched for which the city paid a whopping total of $458,000 to Cosmic Company and Nolan Tam. If the city embraced more of the practical steps Cosmont recommended, that $175,000 might have been worth it. The additional $283,000 paid to Nolan Tam, in my opinion, was a colossal waste of money for which there is no redemption. Anyway, getting back to housing, there is legislation that might be helpful going forward. SB 906 makes it easier to use commercial buildings for joint living and work quarters and AB 2580 streamlines the process of converting a commercial building into long-term housing. There's a few buildings around town that come to mind, and I don't really know how feasible any of them are, but maybe something could be done with the Hatchery building on Railroad Avenue, formerly Terra Restaurant, and that's been empty for two and a half years, or even some of our city-owned buildings. Anyhow, one thing is for certain, it's gonna take a lot of creativity and a great deal of political will to meet our upcoming housing requirements. But I know it can be done and I can really hardly wait to see how we're gonna do it, but I'm sure we will. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Are there any additional public comments? I'm looking right now. Um, yes, we do have uh, additional public comment. Um, first name, Sophia. T, uh, that's the first initial of your last name. I'm going to just give me one second. I'm going to allow you to speak and you should be able to unmute yourself. 
Thank you very much. I'm uh, Sophia Tsulamingras and honorable members of the city council. I'm here today uh, to request that the city of St. Helena address the lack of proper crosswalks available for the children of St. Helena to safely walk or ride to schools daily. I'm asking that this issue be added to your agenda for review. Currently on the west side of St. Helena, Spring and Madrona streets both lack crosswalk in the natural traffic patterns children use to get to school, making it unsafe for both children and drivers alike. I live in the neighborhood south of Spring Street and east of Valley View. This neighborhood is heavily populated with families and children, and I'm alarmed how many times I've witnessed near misses. Just to quickly remind you of the current situation. On Spring Street, we have a crosswalk at Valley View, uh, which currently is one of the busiest intersections in our town. Traffic here is at its peak during the school start and end times with parents racing to get kids to primary and high school on time, as well as workers getting to Sulphur Springs Avenue um, and head out of town. The next available wall, uh, crosswalk um, after Valley View on spring heading east is at Kearney, leaving kids South of Spring Street, the only options at Kearney or Oak Streets with a proper crosswalk. Madrona, like Spring, has become one of the through streets that drivers and large trucks use to avoid Highway 29 or get to wineries. Madrona's first crosswalk traveling east, and this is um, all the way from the very dead end of Madrona, um, is at Kearney. And then again, we have another crosswalk at Oak. There are also many workers that are starting to use these two streets who don't live in the area and may not be aware that kids are going to school. Traffic on the side streets has increased, as you all know, as people try to get past the backup on 29. The route to school for these kids is unsafe and a recipe for disaster. Again, my neighborhood has many kids and parents should be able to either have crossing guards or a couple of crosswalks in high traffic streets like Spring and Madrona to ensure ev everyone's safety. safety. I'm requesting that the city adds either one additional crosswalk and or stop sign on both Spring and Madrona streets. Now, I understand that our city is facing many difficult issues at this time, and, I, I, and not all issues are of the same magnitude. Clearly, we have big problems right now. But I'm frustrated that our schools are encouraging riding and walking to school, as they should, yet my own child was almost plowed down by a teacher uh, last school year riding home from school. And this wasn't the teacher's fault at all. It was my son's fault because he wasn't using a crosswalk, but there wasn't a crosswalk available. I'm concerned that our luck will run out and how inept will we all feel as a community if just one child is injured or God forbid killed going to school. I wouldn't want to see that happen. I know you all wouldn't. I ask that we please not complicate this issue by lumping it into the city's bigger bucket of projects and then requiring multiple meetings, studies, budget approvals, and then ultimately nothing getting done. While I don't wish to skip the normal procedures that the city council um, it needs to have um, to make projects go through. I feel strongly that we can't wait for politics or bureaucracy at this time, but we need to put our kids safety first. Nothing Thank is you. simple. I get it, you know, but sometimes common sense must be prioritized. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, which we received by, by mail as well today. So thank you. The, so one I'm of looking the right now. Oh, sorry. Oh, I just had one thought. I know that the, the Bicycle Coalition had been uh, working on their safe routes to school, and I'm wondering if maybe there's some data already set there. I'm seeing Anna's hand. I am. I would like to ask, actually, that this be put on our agenda to relook at. I've been so grateful with the city's work with the Hunt Street Gap and also making the crossing safer at the areas that we've heard about on Main Street and also now College and Pope. 
I think people don't realize how much money it takes to put those lightings in. I think it was around $90,000 at the Pope Street Crossing. But I have heard so much about this from Sophia and I had a long conversation. I've also talked to many other parents before when they were concerned about this and we went through the ATSC. And I think that there's a unique opportunity now because not only are the schools really encouraging safe biking to school, but we as a city are also, we've all been a part of this in our climate change goals. So I would love for this to come back if there's support and relook at what we could do at these two areas and just see if there's something that would make sense to make it safer for kids to cross. I'm certainly supportive of that. I'm, uh, there may be other council members as well. Yes, I am. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, and now we'll move uh, to back to public forum uh, if there are additional hands or comments. Um, right now, I'm not seeing any additional hands for public comment for public forum. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, we will then bring it back to the council. Um, we will do our reports by staff and city council, future agenda items, and AB 1234 reports. And uh, uh, first, I'll begin uh, by calling on our city attorney if there's anything to report. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Nothing to report tonight. And our city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just want to remind the community that uh, we have a digital roundtable. This is a community conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. That, uh, that meeting is planned for December 3rd. It will be a Zoom meeting uh, that begins at 6 p.m. We're also looking at convening a community forum uh, in a Zoom environment to receive feedback on the fire and the city's response. So we're looking for lessons learned. Uh, we're tentatively uh, scheduling that for November 5th. So that's just around the corner. Uh, I will probably know by tomorrow whether we can lock that in or need to reschedule that. Uh, but when we do, we'll, we'll certainly make that information available. And then I have one item that I'd like to continue um, this evening, Mayor. This is the item related to Scout Hall. I believe it's 10.1 on the agenda. And at the request of the Scouts, um, we'd like to push that out to a future meeting. Okay, very good. Uh, and our finance director. Thank you, Mayor of Ellsworth and Council members. I just have two quick updates. Uh, we are having our second set of, it's going to be a virtual uh, field work for our auditors. They are coming out next week and that's going to be trying to finish up the audit for our fiscal year 18, 19, I'm sorry, 1920 year. And then we did receive notification today that we did, we were awarded the CAFR award for fiscal year 1819. So we we're very excited. They were very delayed in getting that out due to COVID and some other complications, but we did um, receive, receive notice today that we did receive that award. So we're very excited for that. And a big kudos to finance manager, Maddie Kellogg for putting that together for us. That's really tre tremendous. Thank you for sharing that with us. Excellent work. Uh, we will uh, move forward to our city clerk. Nothing to report, Mr. Mayor. And our public works. Thank you, nothing to report. Our planning and building. Thank you, Mayor, nothing to report. Our police or fire. Thank you, Mayor. Police have nothing to report. Nothing to report on fire. Okay. Uh, Council Member Knudsen. Oh, hey, uh, just two things. One is that the uh, open space and walking trails initiative that we covered in a July meeting uh, has been sent back to staff uh, with planning director Maya DeRosa and with the subcommittee uh, fully engaged in order to get um, a series of uh, to take those principles and deliver them into specific policy, a specific set of policies to come back to the council uh, by early spring so that we can make progress uh, next summer on our initial uh, walking trails, the maps, the locations, and, um, and uh, the development agree agreements, all those things that we talked about back in July. The second thing is I'd like to, um, I've been uh, involved in some conversations outside of the city limits just regarding uh, fire response, and I'm hoping that our fire discussion 
Um, and there's a broad-based community discussion that's already started on that. And I'm hoping, and and you know, we're tightly engaged with the county, right? The the there's just no getting around it. Their fire suppression efforts, our fire suppression efforts, um, you know, that it's it's really it it has it'll have to be one and the same in certain ways. And I'm hoping that we can have a, a wider dialogue with the um, lessons to be learned and lessons moving forward. Um, I won't, we'll wait for the meeting itself, but there are a number of citizens and residents both in adjacent areas to St. Helena as well as in the city that want us to take on a, uh, a more comprehensive solution so we, don't, so we don't get stuck and we don't lose as many houses um, as we, not just in the city, but outside the city as we did um, in this last fi fire. And um, I think our fire department did an amazing job. I think those guys were on it. And I also want to salute the, uh, all the volunteers and the people that were vigilant as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we will move to Ms. Chuteau, please. I just want to report that I'm going to be participating in a panel discussion with the League of Women Voters, Napa County tomorrow night, the topics on plastics and the impact on the environment. And you can also have access to a free documentary up until tomorrow night that's really interesting. And you can find all the information if you wanna participate at the League of Women Voters, Napa County website. Thank you. Ms. Koberstein. Uh, <clears throat> since Anna raised plastics, I'm going to talk about garbage. Um, I just want to follow up um, on some discussion that we've had at the council level about ongoing negotiations to amend and restate the agreements between Clover Flat Landfill and UVDS and our Joint Powers Agency, which is a governmental cooperation unit that includes Calistoga, St. Helena, Yountville, and Napa County. Uh, earlier this month, uh, the board unanimously approved amended and restated agreements. Uh, they were not up for renewal. They each had several years to run, uh, but there was a cooperative uh, negotiation that went on for nearly 18 months between the parties. <clears throat> and for the city, uh, we have not only achieved improved uh, oversight and reporting, but these new agreements include um, financial benefits to the members. And um, I'm happy to report that uh, all of the member agencies will be receiving franchise fees uh, from the revenues. Uh, they will be phased in over a period of three years uh, up to 10% at the end of three years. And then they will continue every year thereafter. And the initial uh, modeling that was done that will be repeated again when rates are set in July the projection was that at the end of the three-year phase in, St. Helena would be receiving over $350,000 annually uh, from the revenues of UVDS, which can be put towards road improvement um, and all kinds of, of projects. So um, that was a great uh, win for the member agencies and the members in the agency. That's it. Thank you. And we'll move to our uh, vice mayor, Mr. Doring. I have nothing to report, thank you. Thank you, okay, well, I'll bring it back. Uh, and very briefly, again, I'll just uh, let folks know about the local assistance center. Uh, and this is down at the St. Helena Presbyterian Church. This is uh, uh, the county uh, working with uh, uh, the city and many agencies to provide resources and services. Uh, they appreciate uh, if folks make an appointment, you can make an appointment at 707 299-2190, but they do accept drop-ins. And um, the uh, uh, St. Helena Presbyterian Church is at 1428 Spring Street. Again, readynapacounty.org is the website of the county, uh, emergency services uh, and resources. Uh, also donations uh, are uh, welcomed at the Napa Valley Community Foundation at napavalleycf.org, financial donations. Um, from Supervisor Dillon, uh, yesterday we heard about the Small Business Administration uh, emergency loans available. Folks can go to the website for the Small Business Administration and find out how to apply 
those uh, dates will be coming up in mid-November. So uh, the, the website for the Small Business Administration for businesses affected by the fires. Also, I just wanted to say it was wonderful to go out Saturday to the Pet Parade at Wapo Park. It was just remarkable that this tradition was carried on and it was uh, done remotely. There were a few groups there with, uh, with pets and costumes. It was live streamed and it just kept the spirit going. It was wonderful to see. So I wanna thank our Parks and Rec uh, department for really just keeping things going. So thank you very, very much. Okay, so with that, we're gonna move on now to presentations and public uh, uh, recognitions. We've got a special proclamation um, that we're gonna read together as a council. Um, and this is uh, uh, recognizing our city's uh, employees during the uh, glass fire emergency. Uh, so uh, if folks have their script ready, I'll do my uh, first uh, paragraphs and then I'll hand it to the vice mayor and then we'll work through the script uh, or the proclamation. Uh, and, and, and this will uh, help folks understand just, just how much incredible work was done by our staff and our employees and how much it's appreciated. This is a proclamation recognizing the outstanding contributions of St. Helena city employees during the glass fire emergency and designating the week of November 8th, 2020 as St. Helena city employees week. Whereas at 3.50 AM on Sunday, September 27th, 2020, a vegetation fire was reported near North Fork Crystal Springs Road, north of St. Helena. There was an immediate response from fire, de uh, fire department, two engines and fire department personnel went to the scene, named the glass fire. The incident also quickly prompted a St. Helena Police Department, Nixle at 4.21 a.m. calling for a mandatory evacuation order for residents in the area of Deer Park Road to Crystal Springs Road. Consistent with past fire seasons, the police department attached two officers to work with the county, assisting in evacuations, road closures and security. As the mutual aid call went out at the beginning of the glass fire, St. Helena officers were among the first to respond, going door to door in mandatory evacuation areas, accompanied by two county sheriff officers. And whereas the glass fire was in close proximity to the city's Louis Strala water treatment plant, Tank 1A and the Bell Canyon Reservoir. In the early morning hours of September 27th, many city employees received text messages notifying them of the glass fire and several, several reported to work immediately risking their lives to protect St. Helena infrastructure and property. Two Public Works employees arrived at the treatment plant shortly before 5 a.m. The number quickly grew to six. Under the direction of Assistant Fire Chief Waters, Public Works employees wearing only standard clothes, safety vests, and N95 masks fought the glass fire side by side with City Fire Department and CAL FIRE crews. At the time, there was no way in or out of Crystal Springs Road. Two fire engines were at the scene and one rescued and transferred two people trapped at the top of the hill. The city manager declared a local emergency. And whereas during the LNU fire complex, Chief Sorensen requested that city staff begin clearing and creating defensible space around the treatment plant and those proactive efforts paid off. The glass fire burned completely around the treatment plant prompting Chief Sorensen to characterize the firefighting effort as a total success save. And whereas winds blowing past west generated spot fires from the glass fire, one of which crossed a land bridge of fire fuel along Maple Lane, north of St. Helena, directly to Castello di Amoroso, which was completely involved in the fire, Dario Satui drove through the flames to rescue the animals and... Whereas as a result of the spread of the glass fire over the course of September 27th and the early morning hours of September 28th, Mandatory evacuation orders were issued east of Silverado Trail, west of Highway 29 from Elmhurst Road, north to Deer Park Road and all of Spring Mountain Road, followed by an evacuation warning for the remainder of the west side of St. Helena from Spring Street North, which was upgraded to a mandatory evacuation at 3.12 a.m. on September 28th. Whereas Fire Chief Sorensen describes the glass fire as, quote, the one we've been training for as close as it gets, end quote, to home. Fire department personnel were working 24 hour and 12 hour on and off shifts. On September 28th, the city manager ordered all city employees to work remotely unless they worked in the field or had been asked to report for work. Emergency operations staff were directed to report at 9.30 a.m. 
meeting at previous meeting as previously planned. Whereas police department personnel worked 18 hour days and dispatch officers, several of whom were displaced themselves, were inundated with and responded to a huge influx of citizens calls. Assisted by officers from other jurisdictions, the police department set up hard road closures at the edges of neighborhoods under mandatory evacuation. They patrolled the, the city to ensure public safety and eliminate vandalism and theft. Police volunteers assisted with escorting residents in mandatory evacuation areas to obtain temporary access to their homes. Whereas on September 28th, most if not all St. Helena was without power. In the morning, city staff received visual confirmation that the three Meadowood water tanks burned and were non-functional, cutting off potable water supply to Meadowood and the residents in, Madrone, no, in, in the Madrone Knoll area. City staff coordinated with Cal OES to develop immediate and long-term repair plans. Team members of the city logistics section worked to ensure local lodging, and food and water for essential employees who were evacuated and secure water for the Meadowood area until temporary tanks could be installed. And whereas city staff in the public works and finance departments immediately procured 11 emergency contracts to address the damage to the Meadowood tanks and to assess water quality and remove debris around the treatment plant. With initial damages estimated at over $2 million, the city finance manager prepared an initial damage assessment to Cal OES and REMIF. Finance department staff worked with other departments to ensure proper documentation of time and costs to enable the city to qualify for immediate reimbursement, a process that will continue for another two to three months. The building department conducted site visits to document damage assessments. The human resources department set up crisis response counseling sessions for city employees and created temporary badges for contractors who were assisting public works in cleanup and debris removal. And whereas overnight on September 28th, firefighters cut an extensive dozer line and completed firing operations behind the Sylvaner subdivision, my subdivision, <laughs> and near the White Barn and Sulphur Springs Road. The glass fire proved to be dynamic and fluid. <clears throat> As of 10 a.m. on September 29th, it had burned 46,560 acres and was 0% contained, but favorable winds helped protect St. Helena. <clears throat> Whereas by the evening of September 30th, the entire city of St. Helena was under either an evacuation warning or a mandatory order. Air quality was unhealthy. Buses were placed on standby to assist with evacuation of congregate living facilities if necessary. The chief building official toured most of the Eastern Hills to evaluate the extent of destruction. Remarkably, only one structure within the city was burned. And whereas, as of Thursday, October 1st, the glass fire had burned 56,781 acres and was only 5% contained. Air quality remained unhealthy. Heavy smoke was limiting aircraft firefighting efforts. The city restored power to the Rutherford homes and Elmhurst pump stations, the Cronella and Corporate Yard lift stations, and to the Corporate Yard and Wastewater Treatment Plant. Other locations continued to operate on generator power. On the evening of October 1st, a red flag warning was issued to remain in effect until 6 a.m. on October 3rd, with the probability of ignition ranging between 95 and 100%. And whereas throughout the week, the planning director supported the EOC creating and updating incident objectives, the logistics sections shopped for groceries to fill six days worth of to-go snack bags to support public works employees. And whereas as of October 3rd, the fire department determined it was safe to begin cleanup in the Meadowood area 
and prepared for temporary tank removal. Three tanks were installed on October 5th. The dozer line along the western edge of the city was cut to 200 feet deep. The most active areas of the glass fire were near Boothay State Park and toward Pope Valley. Air quality was improving, thereby allowing utilization of aircraft to fight the glass fire in the active areas near Mount St. Helena. And whereas Sunday, October 4th, was the eighth consecutive work day for many city staff, the police and fire chiefs coordinated with CAL FIRE to ensure safe repopulation of St. Helena mandatory evacuation areas. And whereas, as of October 6, multiple agencies, including St. Helena Police and fire departments, were coordinating through CAL FIRE to lift or reduce evacuation orders. On the afternoon of October 7, evacuation orders were lifted throughout St. Helena and many residents were finally allowed to return home. Whereas throughout the glass fire emergency, <clears throat> the city clerk and public information officer and team issued 47 comprehensive and informative morning, midday and evening press releases. When the glass fire began on September 27th, the PIO and the city manager worked through the night and into Monday evening without rest in order to keep the community informed of fire conditions evacuation warnings and orders, power outages, and more. Bilingual staff across three city departments faithfully translated press releases daily during the emergency. Over the course of the emergency, Spanish translation of city communications was updated from a pool environment to a designated daily translator. And whereas throughout the scope of the glass fire emergency, city employees were multitasking and repeatedly exhibiting self selflessness, flexibility, and adaptability. Many continue to work outside the scope of their given job descriptions due not only to the fire, but the continued COVID-19 emergency. In addition to keeping up with daily emergency operations, city staff continue to perform their day-to-day -day city services and responsibilities. Serving customers, working on the annual audits, preparing for land use hearings and assisting other departments. And whereas miraculously but tragically, the glass fire destroyed only three homes and one structure in St. Helena. No city employees were seriously injured, although some who fought the fire sustained minor facial burns and smoke inhalation. On October 20th, 2020, after 23 days of firefighting, the glass fire was declared 100% contained. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Helena City Council for itself and on behalf of the entire community gratefully recognizes and honors all St. Helena City employees for their dedication and selfless work to protect, serve, and save the city of St. Helena from potentially devastating impacts of the glass fire, while continuing to deliver normal services to city residents and businesses and perform the basic functions of their positions. Be it further resolved that Jeff Ellsworth, Mayor of the City of St. Helena and the entire City Council hereby proudly issue this proclamation on behalf of the City, proclaiming the week of November 8th, 2020 as St. Helena City Employees Week. And ask, excuse me. And, and ask all who live and work in our community to join us during scheduled events that week to express our deep gratitude to our city employees for all that they do to strengthen our community through their service to all of our residents and businesses. And I'd like to ask uh, if Mr. Presswich would accept this proclamation on behalf of the council. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to accept it on behalf of our staff and uh, you've seen uh, that we have a terrific staff that has just gone the extra mile. It's, it's incredible the work that they've done all year, um, beginning with other challenges that we had at the end of last year, but into this year. And I'm so proud of the work that they've done. I'm so thankful that our community has largely made, this, made, through, made it through this particular event uh, and we're stronger because of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. And the three of the words in here that just ring true are selflessness, flexibility, and adaptability. It's just remarkable what this staff has, has, has done. So thank you.
So now we'll move to uh, a proclamation um, for the National Friends of the Libraries Week uh, presented to Maria Christian Stell and Cecilia Raffo and the St. Helena Public Library Friends and Foundation uh, and the St. Helena Public Library Friends and Foundation. Are um, Cecilia or uh, Maria here this evening? Yes, great. So this is the City of St. Helena Proclamation, National Friends of, the Li of Libraries Week, April, October 18th to 24th, 2020. Whereas Friends and Foundation, St. Helena Public Library raises funds that enables our library to move from good to great, providing the resources for programming, additional part-time staff, support for the library's various summer reading programs and special events throughout the year, which help lead to positive uh, civic engagement and the betterment of our community. Whereas the work of Friends and Foundation highlights um, an ongoing, on an ongoing basis, the fact that our library is the cornerstone of the community, providing opportunities for all from the very young to the senior citizen to engage in the joy of lifelong learning and connect with the thoughts and ideas of others from ages past to the present. Whereas the Friends and Foundation understand the critical importance of well-funded libraries and encourage community support for the library along with advocating to ensure that our library gets the resources it needs to provide a wide variety of services to all ages, including access to print and electronic materials, along with expert assistance in uh, research, readers, advisory, and children's services. Whereas Friends and Foundation promotes the joys and benefits of literacy and learning for all ages by investing time and effort in raising supplementary funds to enhance library resources and programming. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jeff Ellsworth, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, along with the St. Helena City Council, proclaim October 18th through 24th, 2020, as Friends of Libraries Week in St. Helena, and urge everyone to thank Friends and Foundation for all they do to make our library and community so much better. Thank you. Maria uh, or Cecilia, do you have a few uh, uh, comments, words to? I, I do, I do, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, National Friends of Libraries Week is really a time to celebrate our very generous community. Friends and Foundation is so grateful to the many donors who contribute every year to our annual campaign and who come to bookmark Napa Valley, our fundraiser every year. Um, so thank you to all of, of you out there. Um, this has been a really, really rough year and we miss our little ray of sunshine that is our library. Um, I think we could all use a little fun distraction. So since we can't have bookmark Napa Valley in January, obviously, um, I invite you to visit our Facebook page at Support St. Helena Library. Check out our gala for this year called Stay Home and Read a Book Gala. And you can post a picture of yourself reading your favorite book um, with the hashtag bookmark Stay Home and Read 2021. Take a look, it's, it'll be fun, fun distraction. So again, thank you all for this recognition and thank you to our community on behalf of the board of directors and myself, uh, uh, our community of generous library supporters and our wonderful library staff. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do you have a few? Thank you, Maria, very, Thanks. very much appreciated. So now um, I'm seeing uh, Chief Hartley. Uh, we're gonna move on to a city of St. Helena proclamation uh, uh, on uh, November Men's Health Month. Uh, Chief Hartley, are you here to accept this proclamation? Yes, Mayor, I am. Very good. So this is the fourth annual St. Helena Movember Men's Health Month, November 1st through November 30th, 2020. Whereas prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men in the US and testicular cancer is the most common cancer in young men aged 15 to 34 in the US and around one in four adults in the US will experience a mental health problem in a given year. And whereas numerous studies have shown that early detection of any form of cancer is instrumental in combating the disease. And since using early detection tests for prostate cancer became fairly common in the United States around 1990, the prostate cancer rate de uh, death rate has dropped. And whereas the American Cancer Society recommends prostate cancer screenings for men of average risk who are 50 years old or, or higher, men of high risk who are 45 years or older, and men of even higher risk, those with two or more direct relatives who have had prostate cancer who are 40 years and older. And whereas the key to educating people about the benefits of early detection 
through routine exams is creating awareness campaigns designed to stimulate conversation. And whereas the Movember movement, which began in 2003, has raised over $650 million and funded over 1,000 programs focusing on prostate cancer, testicular cancer, poor mental health, and physical inactivity in men. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jeff Ellsworth, mayor of the city of St. Helena, along with the St. Helena City Council, do hereby proclaim November 1st through November 30th, 2020, Movember, Men's Health Month. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartley, Chief Hartley, do you have a few words? Certainly. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council members. The month of November, or as we recognize Movember, is recognized as Men's Health Awareness Month. In recognition of this month, men will grow mustaches and beards in support and for awareness of men's health. Prostate cancer is one of the most common and deadly diseases, which is exclusive to men. We have lost several retired St. Helena PD officers from prostate cancer. And we also have retired and active St. Helena Police Department officers who have survived prostate cancer by early detection. The month of November is a simple reminder to all of us the importance of men's health, the importance of self-care and regular checkups. Thank you for your recognition and constant support. Thank you, Chief. Okay, we'll move on now to our um, staff briefings. Uh, we'll start with our- uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, just yes. one second. Um, I wanna take the time to thank council member Koberstein for diligently taking a great effort to put that proclamation together for the city employees and first responders. Obviously there's a great amount of detail there. She, she spent a lot of time uh, going through that and these, these proclamations don't just happen on their own. So thank you, uh, council member Koberstein. No, I'll add to that as well. Thank you. It was uh, beautifully written. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, and we'll, we'll circle back uh, on one of our items here talking about uh, uh, employee uh, recognition uh, uh, week coming up. So we'll touch back on that. So thank you. Um, so we'll move now to our staff briefing and uh, we'll talk about our update. Uh, this is item 7.1, the update on wastewater treatment plant upgrade uh, project. And this is uh, Ms. Smithies. Thank you, um, Mayor. We received the, the second draft uh, submittal for our initial study. Um, we're hoping this will be finalized um, once we get these comments back that hopefully we can get it out in public, um, as publish the draft CEQA and NEPA for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, once we have that out, um, we'll be, we're, we're still on track for December for getting that draft out and that keeps us on schedule for advertising or going out to construction, hopefully by spring of next year. So um, we're staying on track with that. And uh, right now we're having our city attorney just review it just for making sure we've met everything on there that uh, from the first round of comments. Very That's why I had the report, but we're staying right on schedule. Thank you. Okay, any council question, comment? Okay, we'll move on now to our Upper York Creek Dam project update also by Ms. Smithies. Thank you. Um, when we last brought this up, we were about 95% completed. Um, it was back in September before the fires. Um, the three days before the fire, um, the 95% the was completed and the traffic signals were removed from Spring Mountain Road. Unfortunately, the following week, the Monday morning, we were informed of the fire on Spring Mountain and York Creek, which devastated about 30, of, um, excuse me, six of the 36 structures. Um, we just circled back um, and York Creek. It was safe to go return there and do a site visit last week. And six of the, the 36 structures, the sediment logs downstream of the dam were severely impacted. Um, the good news is that, um, that we can make repairs on those items. Um, we, we, included, um, we included it with our emergency response costs in case we had to go in there and replace all 36. Um, it's included on our Cal OES claim or our initial um, estimate to for the, on the glass fire incident. Um, the water board um, agrees with our, our reparations or, or fixes on those sediment logs. Today, the contractor was back up there to, to work on the rest of the project, which is the, um, the area between the dam notch and the upper stream was basically untouched. The, um, all the new, um, the sediment removal above the dam, the dam notch itself, um, because of the wide open and all the tree removals that were done in advance of the fire, um, that virtually stayed untouched. Um, so they are finishing up the fencing and gates today. 
They'll be back tomorrow to make repairs um, downstream of the dam. And hopefully um, we'll claim back to the council with the notice of completion um, in the next couple of months, if not sooner, it's about germination of the hydro seeding that they're gonna be starting on tomorrow. Um, in addition, we'll be invoicing a big invoice um, to the Prop 84 granting agencies and EPA this week um, because we have basically um, been invoiced out most of the contracts. So um, we will be able to um, start recouping some of the grant funding, serious grant funding that we have not been able to um, the past four years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the re work up there is just remarkable that's been done and thank you for shepherding that uh, forward. Uh, is there any council comment or question on this item? Uh, Mr. Knudsen? Yeah, I had discussed this with the um, city manager uh, a month or two ago about having the open space folks walk at a time that would work for the contractors up on the York Creek Dam site. Ms. Smithies, and we have our meeting tomorrow. I wondered if um, maybe we could coordinate to bring a representative of the group up to the site uh, when possible. I would wait till they've been demobilized since they're heavily working back. This is their first week back since the fires. Um, they literally finished the Thursday before the fires and just got back in there today. Um, you could probably get back up there once they're done with the, the work tomorrow or the next day, but um, it's also not safe to walk the creek itself. There are a lot of trees. Um, it was um, concerning to walk downstream last week um, with all the burnt trees that are surrounding the site. Um, but the dam site itself, that, that's accessible once they're off the site. Great, maybe, uh, maybe in a week or so, thank you. Thank you. So we'll move now to our uh, city manager with a glass fire and COVID-19 update, Mr. Presswich. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so the proclamation did a great job of updating uh, the community and uh, thanking the staff for the glass fire uh, response. And uh, as was mentioned, the fire is 100% contained. It is a bit amazing to uh, think back that that, was, that uh, announcement only came seven days ago. So a very significant event for our community. I uh, also want to mention that the president did declare a, a, a federal disaster. He issued a federal disaster declaration that will allow the city to receive substantially more reimbursement for its emergency costs. And at this point, it appears that the city's exposure for eligible costs will be approximately six and a quarter percent of all of those costs that were incurred or will be incurred associated with the disaster. Happy to answer any questions on the glass fire. Are there any questions uh, from council at this point? Seeing none, thank you uh, for the update and uh, thank you for I, the continued efforts as we move forward. You bet, and then I'll move to the COVID. I should probably also mention that since the fire chiefs on um, the Zoom call, we will probably continue to receive um, or see smoke in the hills and uh, that's not uncommon until we have our first rain and uh, we had some calls and I think a few scares today on the western hills but that's something that we should expect uh, to happen until it rains so uh, just something to keep in mind if any condition changes we'll certainly um, message that with respect to COVID uh, and the COVID emergency a couple of weeks ago, I indicated that, that the numbers were looking good and that we were likely to move uh, from the substantial red phase into the moderate uh, tier. And that did happen. Uh, the numbers over the past week that, that come out every Tuesday, the numbers that came out today, uh, unfortunately, began trending the wrong direction. Um, the good news for the city is we will remain in, this, in the moderate tier for at least another week. Um, this, the data that we're seeing that was announced today reflects the reporting period between no October 5th and October 17th. So it lags a little bit uh, between today's date. And as a result, um, it, at the moment, our, one of our two, our case rate, uh, our case rate, which is the seven day average per 100,000, has increased in the past week from 3.6, this is an adjusted number, to 4.3. And it needs to be under four to remain in the moderate uh, classification. If we don't meet that test, then there's uh, 
that a lot that means that we would move back a tier. Uh, however, the state recognizes that there's a lag on the data. And so for counties that aren't meeting their, their metrics on either their case rate or their positivity rate, they will look at trends in the, in the previous couple of days uh, before deciding to move a county from one tier backwards to another tier. So it's, it's still too early to determine whether we would slip from moderate to substantial where we were a couple of weeks ago. Um, if the numbers start to turn a little bit in the, in the coming days in the testing that's occurring, then we will remain in the moderate. So we'll continue to report on that um, into the future. The, uh, the city's rate for the positivity rate um, a week ago was 3.3%. It's, uh, I'm sorry, that's the statewide rate. Uh, statewide, that's 3.2% now. And the city's adjusted rate uh, last week was 2.1%. It did jump to 4.1%, which puts that also in the moderate uh, classification. So uh, it meets moderate, uh, but because one of the two criteria is not currently meeting the uh, moderate tier, it's possible that we will move back and we'll, we'll notify the community. The county will continue to message that over the coming week and as, condition, as conditions change. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on the COVID emergency. So, so we want to continue urging that, that protocol with the wearing the mask, the, the washing of the hands and washing the distance as, as we go. We're not through this yet. We're, we're working through it, but uh, still need to keep that protocol going. And, and continued testing is important as well. So as opportunities come forward for testing, uh, continued testing regionally makes uh, a difference as well. Very good. Any council questions, comments here at this point? Okay, very good. Thank you. So now we'll move to the uh, consent uh, part of our calendar. My understanding is 8.1 will not be heard tonight. Uh, Cindy, is that uh, okay? So I'm going to read the numbers uh, uh, starting with 8.2. And if anybody uh, wants an item pulled, you can let me know if we see a hand come up. So 8.2, seeing none, 8.3, seeing none, 8.4, seeing none. So those are our consent items. If somebody would like to uh, 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 put forward a motion to pass the consent calendar. I'll move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 8.1. And a second. Did we hear a second? Oh, I'm seeing Mr. Knudsen. And a roll call, please. Councillor Fulberstein? Yes. Councillor Knudsen? Okay. David, can we, I think it's muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Citeau? Yes. Vice Mayor Doring? Yes. Mayor Elper? Yes. Okay, so now we'll move uh, past our public hearing, seeing none, we'll move to uh, old business. Uh, and our first item 10.1 has been continued uh, to a further date. So we'll move into item 10.2, and this is discussion and direction on the construction schedule for capital improvement project R18-81, downtown sidewalk improvements. And this is Ms. Smithies, please. Mayor, I'm going to begin briefly, oh, yes, uh, just, yeah. to, just to let you know that uh, we've wanted to bring you an update on uh, the downtown sidewalk project uh, for a couple of months now. And uh, so we're here finally. We want to share with you updates to uh, provide updates to you regarding the, the review that's happening with other agencies and how that's affecting our project because uh, like us, they've uh, had impacts associated with COVID. And uh, it raises a question for us uh, about whether we proceed uh, as quickly as possible or whether we uh, continue this out to a, a further period. I think the, the challenge for the city is we may not be able to guarantee deadlines, but we do believe that we can 
continue to expedite the project and and uh, meet deadlines, meet the prior uh, construction forecast to the extent possible. But there could be delays because at the moment we don't have all of our approvals that allow us to to advance the project uh, to uh, a formal review, final review with Caltrans. So. Uh, we're looking for feedback tonight uh, from you on that front and our public works director, city engineer, uh, Erica Smithies will provide a, a report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so but when we last spoke, I think I believe it was in early May about ex expediting the project. We never stopped expediting the project on, on the staff side. The consultant continued. Um, we had the CEQA completed in end of May. We had negotiations started with the Middletown Rancheria, which was a good thing because we used the template for the tribe for the Upper York Creek project that we had to do monitoring on as well. So we proceeded along, but the process that has been slowed down the most has been the NEPA process through Caltrans. Um, that is the National Environmental Protection Act um, and the Section 106 consultation. As, as you are aware, um, some of you are aware, we used um, our reach out to our elected to help expedite that process in order to get the Upper York Creek regulator, regulator, regulatory agencies to proceed. But the biggest holdup of the Upper York Creek was the same agency that took long a time to review the Caltrans project for um, the downtown streetscape. Um, we started the NEPA process in May or April. It's taken over 140 business days to get to a point where we could submit last week to Caltrans our final historic and cultural and, and, um, and documentation. Um, I have Priya Nixon is going to help me show you what it would look like if we can stay on track and continue forward with a 2021 calendar schedule, um, expediting now that once we have final design, uh, we received 90% plans in July. Um, it's a big set of plans, over 70 pages that we've taken our time to review because we cannot finalize those plans until, until we have our final NEPA authorization from Caltrans. So if we are to receive um, our, our final environmental clearance um, by uh, mid-November, we could start the process of final design, um, submit to E76 to Caltrans um, for, uh, not E76, the encroachment permit process because we are working on Highway 29. We still need an encroachment permit even to do the sidewalks, which are the maintenance are, is on the city. So if we were to submit the same day we were to get authorization from Caltrans for an encroachment permit application, the typical timeline is 30 to 45 days. So if we had no turnaround or new resubmittals, um, we're looking at an end of December date. Um, and then once we have that approval, we can move forward with authorization of construction requests from Caltrans. Normal, normal time period is, is, is a month. Um, we're putting 10 days, 10 business days to expedite that review because Many agencies have postponed their OBAG grant projects. Many have pushed them out due to lack of funding with the match, um, due to COVID, lack of revenues. Um, just they've, they've tabled their projects a full fiscal year. Um, but, if, but so we're hoping with that, we could still maybe even get a more expedited review of two weeks. Um, since we're not going to, the Caltrans office will not be slammed with a whole bunch of authorization requests. So there's a possibility it could happen in two weeks, but reality is probably 30 days to even up to four months, depending on their workloads as they are taking furloughs as well. They're working um, remotely, um, just like many other agencies are during COVID um, and uh, no expectations right now when they're gonna re, uh, return to work normal. Um, so with that in mind, we're looking at a January timeline if we can expedite 14, 10 days um, then we could bring it back to council for authorization of advertisement and bid in January. We could do that concurrently, but we just can't do anything until we get the authorization from Caltrans. Um, then we would need to go out to advertise. We have six months from E76 construction contract authorization um, to actually hit the streets and award the project. And um, we could look at a February. We need at least 28 days, 21 to 28 days, which would be a notice to proceed around March that's a really fast paced timeline. And then March, um, they could hopefully start construction and finish um, the base construction work. You can scroll down a little bit. Um, I think they have it finished. Um, I'm seeing some problems on this timeline. We, we, we kind of rushed the, the um, 
scroll down to the next page, probably the second page. I believe it's more than just two months of work. So I, I don't think it could be finished in two months, but I'm seeing 45 days, 20 days, nights and weekends per phase on Main Street. Okay, maybe it is just 45 working days. That's pretty fast. And we could be potentially done with the project by May. And then there's the longer term calendar. If you can go to the next slide, Priya, please. If we were to slow it down, we have till June 30th to submit for this, this fiscal year. Um, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission has extended the grant deadline for meeting this year's um, obligation of June 30th, 2021. So if we were on a regular speed, um, everything takes its process. Um, we would submit for the encroachment application between December, get it around April, um, E76 authorization to go in April. We received, um, they're still like looking at a construction schedule of, of next May for 45 business days, um, or we could submit by June 30th of 2021, go out for bids, and sometime in the fall, this is not on the calendar, this is another alternative scenario where you go out to, to bid sometime in the fall after authorization from Caltrans and then award construction contracts and have them start in January of 2021, 2022. Um, I think that's at the bottom. I think the upper ones are wrong. But like, if you just scroll down to the item um, on item 13, it shows 45 days starting on February 21st, 2022. I, caught, I got out of sequence there, I apologize. So notice proceed in December and then start and right after Christmas on, in 2022, which was our original game plan for this coming um, calendar year, 2021. Um, pushing it out to 2022 would allow for the sewer lateral work to take place, give, give us a longer year. We postponed getting the sewer lateral replacement um, public outreach because right when council authorized the loan loan program to building owners, the LNU complex fires hit. Just when that was dying down, then the glass fires. So we were just wrapping up to get that out to public outreach and, and pausing for just the year or even six months can give us the time needed and the building owners the time needed to get um, their loan agreements executed and their construction work done on the sewer laterals. There's 27 sewer laterals on Main Street within the project limits that really need to get replaced or, or repaired. So pausing until 2022 would not only allow the building owners time to get that work taken done, um, it also gives PG&E time to not compete with them during our construction project in 2021 as they do their, their gas main improvements on Main Street and around Oak. I think that precedes my um, that completes my presentation. Are there any? So we're, we're looking. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Please, Miss Smithies. What we're, what we're looking here is like a direction from council is, is do we proceed on schedule with 2021, even though it's pushed out from January, or do we pause and wait till 2022? Uh, are there initial questions or comments from council? I have a few, but I want to see if. Ms. Koberstein? Um, I have a question about the sewer laterals, and perhaps this is for Ethan. Um, I know we're trying this voluntary sort of carrot and stick approach to get the business, um, the owners of the properties to do the work. Um, I'm wondering if we have looked into what ability the city would have to do the work um, if we wanted to try to expedite it as one project or move it along more quickly. Uh, than the individual replacements. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, we've discussed that at some level. I don't think we've come to a decision on whether or not that would be the most efficient thing to do. I, I think part of the issue really is it relates to the fact that we'd be going onto people's property underneath their businesses potentially and that type of thing, which, you know, could potentially have some additional liability for the city. And we just want to evaluate what that looks like. Um, so I don't think we've come to a decision on that. I have discussed it with, um, uh, with the city staff as, as Kara did before me. So, you know, I think that's an option, but I think if we can encourage them to do it on their own, that would be the, uh, the, the path of least resistance. E e e Mary, do you have another uh, follow-up on that? I had a, a related question on that. Uh, if, 
if we were to ask the uh, business owners to, you know, be in charge of their each of their separate businesses, is there a way to work with um, uh, a group of contractors uh, who are all uh, aware of each other working on the project? You know, whether it's one, two, three contractors. Just I'm I'm wondering if there's a way that we can find some way to you know, have these business owners. There's some consistency. Um, in, in how this is coordinated so uh, folks don't feel like they're running off in a thousand different directions. Sure, I, th I think we can, there are some ways that we can give people some guidance. I don't think we wanna be restrictive in how we do it, but I think we can work with with the group and try to get people who are familiar with the work and try to um, you know, give, give, give the, uh, the business owners as much help as we can to facilitate the process. So, so, you know, they're not running off in a bunch of different directions. Um, you know, there's some, there's some, uh, some things that we've thought about to, to, to go down that road to give them some guidance at least. Okay. Additional questions uh, here, Ms. Chateau? I have a question. When uh, city manager Presswitch, when you talked about that we can't guarantee deadlines, does that mean that the grant funding would that would be at risk if we push this out? No, the the grant funding's not at risk. We just said we have to to push the button on the E76. Is that by June, Erica? So we we still need to <laughs> proceed to June, and we we know we're comfortable that we'll meet we'll meet that deadline. I guess my my point was that if we commit to moving forward as quickly as possible it's possible that factors outside of our control will contribute to a potential delay to the start of the project. And instead of beginning, you know, I think our sweet spot is probably March through June. That's been the conversation that we've had with the downtown businesses for the past 18 months or more. And with the idea that the, the larger pedestrian season is July through the fall and, uh, and trying to avoid that particular point in the year. Uh, the silver lining to a potential delay though is that the weather conditions will be better. We'll have fewer weather conflicts in as the as this as the city as the project if the project started a little bit later in the year. So instead of starting in March when it still may be raining, if we started in June, for example, that would allow us uh, and and probably guarantee dry weather for the entire project which would allow us to get in and out even quicker and, and reduce the risk of weather impacted delays. Thank you. Other, uh, Mr. Knudsen? Well, I just wonder if this, if we should have public comment and then I can make my. Okay, I'll, I'll open it to public comment now and we'll see if folks have uh, any input or questions here. And I'll look to Priya. Sure, I'm looking right now to see if there are any members of the public who would like to provide public comment on this item. And I am not seeing any raised hands for this item. Okay, very good. So with that, I'll bring it back to the council and I'll go to Mr. Knudsen. Yeah, uh, in my view, I think um, the business community has spoken clearly in terms of date certain and minimal impacts. And if we're in a place where, you know, it, there's trade-offs, right? But if we're in a place where um, the, the impacts may be greater and there may be you know, less date certain, that seems to me we've lost. And so you know, I'd rather go for date certain and most efficient rather than you know, some sort of like, well, we'll see. Um, that's, that's my perspective on, uh, on minimizing impacts to, um, to merchants. What is the uh, the uh, the size of the PG&E work that's that they're discussing happening in 2021? The scale of that. I thought it was six to seven months, and it starts north of Dot, crosses Sulphur Creek, and then gets up to Mitchell, a little bit at Pope, and then it crosses over Mitchell Drive up to Oak Avenue and around. But the most impactful work is um, to Main Street. It's going to be that first section, and then it goes around to Oak Avenue. And do they have a date certain on that yet? 
They've been telling us 2021 and probably the same time frame as this construction. Okay. Any thoughts uh, from the council here where we're at? What, oh, Ms. Koberstein? I think it's too early to make this decision. I, I think we should wait to see if we get the approval that we are anticipating in November. Um, keep track of this timeline. Um, and there may be a point where it's obvious that we should postpone the project, but I'm not sure it's obvious yet. And in talking with some of the business people, uh, they still feel the project would be better in 21, even if it was March, April, May, uh, because we are still likely to be in sort of a COVID environment, um, as opposed to a year long delay, when maybe hopefully things are more normal. Um, some of them would prefer us to proceed, even if it means starting in March instead of starting in January or February. So I, I think we should keep track of the timeline uh, and see what happens and report back and you know maybe take the temperature of the business community. I've only spoken with a few of them, but I think their input would be helpful. Thank you. Is there, um, uh, on the sewer lateral project, part of this project, is that something that if we were to, to in a sense, keep the options open at this point, um, get more in, input from downtown, et cetera. Is there a way that we could push forward on the sewer lateral component of this to, to, to make that start happening uh, so we don't lose traction on that? We, we plan to push forward now. Uh, once we finish uh, opening the, the hub at Hunt, uh, which happens it starts happening tomorrow morning, I believe at 5 a.m. and should be fully open by Friday, um, the staff will pivot to the re revisiting the, the draft letter that we've prepared that will go out to all the business owners with a follow-up um, inquiry by staff. So we have a, a draft uh, document that's uh, about ready. It's still in its final review and uh, that could be released next week. Okay. Uh, council, other thoughts? Vice Mayor? Um, does that letter lay out a scenario where there are certain contractors that we would recommend or, you know, to limit those and maybe a little coordination without getting too far into legal exposure? Um, I guess my point is it would be preferable from my point of view to make it as user-friendly as possible, to make it so that a property owner will go, yeah, that makes sense. I'll do that now. I agree with council member Coberstein. It seems a little premature. I would love to have you come back, you know, in a couple of weeks go, Hey, we got good news. We've got, you know, 25 of the property owners on board. They're ready to go. That would give me more comfort in terms of the decisions that come after that. So I would just, I haven't seen a letter and that's, that's your, that's not my job. That's yours. But if we want to spend a little bit more time and making sure that letter uh, <laughs> gets a good response, I guess, that would be, as you know, I think that would be time well worth, uh, well worth spending. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council thoughts here? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Chateau? No, that sounds good to me. What Vice Mayor Doreen just said, I like the idea of getting that information before making the decision and also what Council member Koberstein spoke about getting input from the business community. I was hoping that there would be some public comment tonight. And I think that it's so difficult with everything that everybody's going through. Um, perhaps there's a way to get that through the Thursday meeting that we have or some other way that I'm not thinking of. Very good. I, I agree that if we can keep our eyes on the ball, the different components um, and keep moving forward, keeping our options open, we'll get to a point where there's some more clarity. Uh, you know, uh, as York Creek Dam moved forward, all the stars sort of had to align and they did to move that forward. So I think if we keep our options open, keep the gears moving on the different aspects of this, uh, it'll give us some clarity in terms of the timing. I, I too, 
the idea of, of waiting a year is really difficult after all the work we've done to, to get this close. So if there's a way that it lines up that we can uh, make it happen, I, I, would, I would like to see it happen sooner rather than later, but also wanting to make sure we're getting that input from downtown, uh, seeing what would work best there. Um, and as Mr. Knudsen said, looking for dates, looking for the least impact, I think we'll get some more clarity uh, in the coming weeks uh, here where we are with that. So I'm, I'm in support of that as well. Mr. Presswich, does that give you? We're gonna we're gonna want to migrate to the public comment and then uh, bring it back to the council. Okay, I did open it for public comment and didn't get okay. any. No. Okay. So um, this is sort of where we're at. No, that's that's helpful, and we wanted to make sure that um, our council uh, had an opportunity to to provide us feedback on the options that were available and as um, information comes in on the NEPA uh, if that happens between now and the 10th the next council meeting will certainly let you know and I think uh, we'll be able to provide information we can um, survey businesses downtown uh, between now and the next council meeting and try to reach and establish contact with those 27 business owners I'm sorry building owners and uh, uh, work on um, showing them the benefit of investing in those sewer laterals now and, and acquainting them with the city council's program that you established um, late um, earlier. So um, we'll plan to bring this back on November 10th uh, with more information. Just one point on the uh, dealing with the owners on the laterals. At some point, will we have to establish a deadline for those property owners to do the work. I mean, we, we can't just kind of keep that fuzzy. We, at, at some point we need to have a deadline. If they don't do it, we have to do it probably. I mean, we have to get a little bit more aggressive at some point, hopefully they'll all do it. But if there are a few that don't do it, then we have to have, you know, <laughs> more certainty there. We all need certainty. So I, I would, Maybe it's premature to put that in the letter right now, but I, we should think about, there's gotta be a hard stop somewhere. The, the letter does include a date now, and I believe it's March of 2021. So um, the expectation is work would be done before that. Um, we know that when they get to the building and do the work, it's a fairly straightforward job. It shouldn't take too many days, a, a day, two, or one, two or three days. It's just a matter of uh, getting them set up with a contractor and and seeing them move forward. So we'll have an opportunity to report back to the council in January and February and keep you apprised of how that contact and, and the work is progressing. If um, we're finding that the work isn't happening fast enough and we're anticipating a challenge, we'll have, a, a, we'll have time to talk about that. I think that that's, that's good and that's, that's wise to make sure that we, we get it all done before the sidewalk actually, uh, so we don't have to tear anything up once it goes down. So uh, that gives you direction, Mr. City Manager. Okay, yes. very good. So now we will move to um, our item uh, 10.3. This is discussion of the St. Helena, uh, City of St. Helena water supply in consideration and possible direction establishing a water shortage emergency condition requiring the implementation of phase two water regulations and formation of the Water Advisory Board. And this is going to be Ms. Smithies. Thank you, it's actually gonna be, a, a, um, I'm gonna follow up with um, Finance Director Mitz on this as well. Um, as, as you're aware, on June 23rd, the council passed the resolution for phase one. Um, we only received 20 inches of rainfall this year and did not even come close to filling our reservoir. Um, we. We um, have ramped up our, our, our Stonebridge well um, up to the max of 30%, um, trying not to you know, stay in line with our, our um, safe yield supply recommendations and adoptions um, done in 2011. We were doing quite well, but no one could forecast that we would have higher than normal um, weather conditions um, consistently through the summer and now the fall. 
um, combined with the amount of fires and suppression activities that um, also we're drawing from our reservoir and from our hydrants, especially in this last fire. Um, we were at a phase two. Um, it was literally triggered at the end of September um, into October um, by, by barely a few percentage points following the, the weighted spreadsheet that was provided and worked on um, by the Safe Yield Committee and developed. Um, it, it means a lot. There's going to be rationing, um, reductions of, of water usage by commercial and residential users, um, and, and um, the formation of a water advisory um, board. Um, the last time we went through this was in 2014. Um, if, if council were is to push forward with the phase two tonight, um, we would probably come back in at least two months. Um, we'd go out to recruit for a water advisory board and come back to council in two months recommend, or with council recommendations um, for that wa water advisory board. Um, and there are, are financial implications um, of exceeding the rationing that's, that's allowed in our code. And I'll let um, Director Mitz take that from here. Great, thank you. Uh, I am going to screen share um, if Priya can set me up for that. Okay. Okay, so as Erica had mentioned, the timeline, what I wanted to do is real briefly show the council and the public what the timeline was last time that we did enter into a phase two. So the last time we entered into a phase two emergency was in January of 2014. And it can everyone see my screen okay? I'm wondering if you can zoom in a little bit on that. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> or a lot. There we that. go. Okay. There we go. So the first time we, or the last time we entered into a phase two was in January of 2014. And so that's when it was established. On February 4th, the city council did hold a special meeting in which the city council directed that violations provided in the municipal code at that time be applied starting with the water period running from April to May with an approximate billing date of May 15th. So it was any water usage that was during April. On, at the February 11th, 2014 regular city council meeting, the uh, city council did officially establish a time frame for violations for non-compliance. And then what they did is because they gave a two month lag time because there is a lot of work on the back end that has to be done between the public work staff and also the finance staff to actually establish what the residential and the non-residential usage is going to be. So that is why there, there was a lag time. In addition, um, establishing the water advisory board. So we had some time from the initial date of January 28th to March 25th, of 2014, when they actually did appoint members to the water advisory board. And the membership of that board is outlined in the staff report. And then fortunately, in this particular case, on April 22nd, 2014, before anything got actually implemented, they terminated the phase two water emergency. So we never actually got to the point of implementing any fines or the actual water advisory board. I, it's unclear if they were actually met or not, uh, but it was terminated before we actually got to the fine implementation. Just to give a quick overview of the different tasks, and I will make this big as well, the, the different tasks that have to take place. Uh, so the first task would be tonight if City Council did declare a phase two emergency. The second task is notification in a, in a public, I believe it's a local, uh, something such as the Sable the Star, notification by the city clerk. The establishment of a water advisory board. Concurrently, survey notices would be sent out to all customers. Uh, we do have to do surveys to customers to be able to accurately depict how many people are in the household. And a sample uh, in, the, in the council report, Samples were actually provided, and those were just directly taken from what we utilized in 2014. Obviously, we know that we will probably need to make some adjustments. We will have to have establishment of fines and the effective date of those fines, and that has to be done by city council. And just a side note on the establishment of fines, the fines that were in place via the municipal code in 2014 were actually removed from the municipal code in 2016. And it was in the wake of the San Juan Capistrano decision. And it was more from what, from what we've looked at as well as had our attorney look at, it 
it might have been more of preemptory to make sure that we weren't in violation of the San Juan Capistrano case. However, in conferring with our city attorney, it does seem that those fines that we had before in place would actually be allowable um, in, in, the current, in the current condition that we're in. And Ethan can definitely answer any specific questions um, from city council on that. Following the establishment of the fines and the effective date, and once we receive the survey notices back, the city will calculate and has to notify customers of what their water allotment is for both residential and non-residential. And then in addition at the same, concurrently the city does uh, make plans for implementation of a water shortage disaster plan. Uh, so just so you, just as a reminder what the residential and the commercial or non-residential looks like, residential is essentially 65 gallons per day um, per person in the household. Single family residences do receive additional allocation per month, just from April through October for landscape irrigation. And the same goes true of multifamily residential mobile home. Uh, so that is something that in the initial phases of this, we do not need to worry about because under the phase two water emergency, uh, there, there's no outdoor landscape irrigation with potable water. Um, same thing for the commercial properties is the allocation per billing period it is to be 10% less than the average use for the four winter months preceding in the non shortage year. So these are all calculations that we would need to work in on the back end of it. So that gives you a little bit of timing for what we would have to go through. The next thing that I did want to show, and I will try to make this as large as possible. Oops, sorry, clicked on the wrong one. Is I just did some random samplings of various customers so we could see what it would look like in the first couple months if the, the phase two shortage. So I just have the customers labeled as one through 12 based on their actual usage. I think the first month, sorry, it's behind my computer screen so I can't see it. <laughs> the first month that I looked at was December. So this is what their actual use was during December. Here's the how many units it's converted because um, there's 748 gallons per unit. So here's the conversion. In the phase two, you're allotted 65 gallons. Here's the number in household. And I realized uh, today when I was actually doing the summary sheet, um, I did not find any any houses. So I had households. So I'd have to look to see who has more than four people in a household, so that we can actually see what it looks like for larger families. Here's your allotment per day your allotment per month. So the total allotment, um, because we're in the winter months, they do not have any allotment for irrigation. Here you can see where they're over or under. And under the other gallon that they pay for over their allotment, third notice is a dollar, a dollar twenty-five and a dollar fifty. So I just wanted to give council an overview of idea of what this looks like. So this particular residence here, they went over by a hundred gallons. So if it was their second notice, it would be $50. Third notice, it would be $100, $125, and $150. Or you can see this other household where they went over by, by substantially a lot. So you'll see their second notice is almost $2,500, $4,900, $6,100, or $7,400 that they would be fined. Again, these are the months where you, don't, you typically have more water, uh, more rainfall. So you might not be doing as much landscape irrigation. And this is, this is without them doing any phase, um, phase one or phase two conservation efforts. This is just taken off of actual usage. But I want to show you when you get down to the months. Uh, so this is your, your March. So March and April, where now people might start land, uh, doing irrigation when they're not supposed to be doing it, but they, but, you know, they might actually be using more irrigation. So you can see where the fines are starting to go up. Um, so in like this one, for instance, was 16,000 if it happened to be their fifth notice. So I just wanted to give city council an overview of what that looked like on the commercial side. If those are all single family residential properties, um, if we go over to the commercial irrigation side, you can see where they definitely are, or sorry, on the commercial with no irrigation. You can see where they um, where they definitely are heavily, you know, heavily penalized based off of what their current usage is. Again, it's not giving them any forewarning. It's not letting them know, hey, start doing the conservation efforts. So hopefully we wouldn't see the fines and penalties this dramatic, but I at least wanted to show you some scenarios that we that we ran. 
So myself and Erica and Mark would are definitely um, happy to answer any questions for any of these items. Are there initial uh, questions from council uh, on where we are with this? Comments, questions? Mr. Knudsen. Um, this is a bitter pill, that's for sure. Um, Ms. Mitz, thank you for that comprehensive um, discussion. Can you compare to sort of the residential um, versus the business? Uh, it was hard for me to tell sort of the scale um, of the fines and the fees and whether they're kicking off at the same proportional level and they're also um, similar proportional amounts. Thank you. I would have to more run, run more analysis on the proportional amounts, but as far as, and I will I'll share my screen one more time so you can see this. Uh, it is a little harder with residents with the commercial properties because it's based on their actual winter, four months of winter average. So what you see here for this, this particular commercial property, this is all of their information basically from September all the way to August, where if you look at the samples for the residential, I truncated everything by month. But if you look at the most common months that we're getting into, so the, the December, January, February, March, which is why I showed, you can see here for this particular commercial property, they did have a lot of usage in January, February, and March. For water, it could, you know, I don't know if it has to do with production. I would, I would even have to verify which customer this was because I just, I kept it generic. Um, for this other particular, you know, commercial customer where you didn't see a lot of signs in the residential during the winter months, you're definitely seeing more of them in the commercial. And then here's one commercial for December to April as well. So you see they have a lot of consumption during these, these couple months. So I don't know if it's just a factor of what what services they're providing. And this is also called commercial with no irrigation. So I could run some more analytics on it, but hopefully that will explain some of it as far as proportionally when the studies start kicking in, but it is based on their actual water usage. Right, so I think the key thing for us to think about uh, and what I'd like to see sort of a further analysis is really sort of the equity, you know, whether it's equitable. So we've made some decisions on residential water rates and our cost to deliver them in the past and um, uh, to businesses and to irrigation. And so whatever we come up with uh, from an encouragement, a carrot and a stick approach, which is unfortunately what we've got to do, um, I think we need to make sure that it's equitable to the residents and the businesses and it should not be weighted uh, one direction or the other. Thank you. Uh, additional council questions or comments here. So the, uh, the, the calculus we're using here is triggered um, as we get to these phases. Um, and, and part of this is looking at a, at a water advisory board. Um, is there a way in, in talking about that board of you know, these, these water issues are California wide. Uh, it's not just the Napa Valley or a St. Helena issue. So there's maybe some standardization uh, that comes through looking at uh, California water management. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking in terms of an advisory committee that we don't operate in a vacuum, that we, we're looking objectively um, and tying in um, with, with practice, uh, you know, the sort of standard across Cal California. Is there a way, as we talk about an advisory committee, to work with, a, I don't know if it's a group like the Association of California Water Agencies or, or somebody who's had uh, practice uh, in areas that have been more sustained in their drought? Uh, is there a way to talk about how, how we set something up like that so that we can uh, sort of clarify the calculus that we use to make these decisions? Erica, I don't know if you have any comments. <laughs> I wasn't here when this was formed, but I believe they would have used what was, you know, it's not inventing something new. You use what your sister agencies are, are utilizing. It's, it's, it has to be consistent. Uh, that's probably why they were concerned with the finding the San Juan Capistrano case, um, reading on it, 
it, it's you know you have to be fair if you're if you're charging penalties and fees there's got to be a reason is it costing more to deliver that water and the answer is yes if we're going to have to provide emergency shortage um, precautions or, or finding water sources to to if we continue on a drought we're going to need to come up with extra funds to buy that water and bring it to the city for the other um, for the residents and customers and just to add to that um Certainly, we would want to bring best practice information to the Water Advisory Board, and we can reach out to water agency peers as well as uh, think tanks on strategies to bring forward as well. Right. I just think that would be that'd be a helpful thing. And knowing that uh, these issues are California issues that are not going away, and so I think there's more of a focus than ever before on making sure these these numbers uh, work equitably. Uh, so that everybody gets their equitable share of the of the resource. Uh, Mayor Mayor Ellsworth, I, I was uh, it's Ethan. I, I I wanted to make one point just on the on the Capistrano case and and how it kind of plays into this and what we're doing with with uh, why there's a distinction here. And you know I'm in full agreement with what the council say. It makes it says it makes a lot of sense to make these these fines equitable, but. But the point I wanted to make is that um, the distinction between what we're doing here and what was going on in the San Juan Capistrano case where their water rates were overturned is they had they had tiered water rates. And, and so, you know, the higher water users paid basically a proportionately larger share cost share than people who were take, using less water to kind of encourage um, water conservation. But it was all kind of baked into their rates. Um, and, and the city in that case made an argument that those higher tiered rates could be justified as penalties that aren't subject to the same kind of level of scrutiny under 218. Um, and the court said that wasn't the case in that instance because um, all of that was part of their entire rate structure. What we're doing here is a little bit different in that these are truly penalties in, in the case of a, of a water emergency where we're at risk of not having sufficient water to serve our users. And so we're, we're essentially fining people if they go over a certain allocated amount. Now, now, I agree the fine should be equitable, but I just wanted to make that distinction clear. This isn't part of our water rates, and, it, and because of that, it's not subject to the kind of the same level of um, review that, that our rates are under Proposition 218. I, I think that's an important distinction regardless of what we're trying to do. I, I think that's a good clarifying statement. Uh, this is an issue that yeah, we've been looking at the last number of years. So having having your eyes on it and, and seeing how we delineate and define here is gonna be, gonna be important. So thank you. Sure. Ms. Koberstein. I think it would be helpful for residents and businesses generally <clears throat> if we would give them a simple formula so that they could look at their water bill, which I think reports how many hundred cubic feet of water you're using, and convert it to gallons so that they would get an idea of how many gallons of water they are currently using every day and could start to do the mental calculation themselves of, oh, this means we're right on par, or maybe we're way over, and encourage people to start to get uh, close to the limit, if they can, uh, before this is even inactive. I mean, I, I myself would have to go pull out my water bill. I have no idea how many gallons of water um, we use in our two-person household. Um, but I think it would help put people in the right frame of mind and figure out exactly what they need to do to, to maybe cut back and come into compliance. Yeah, a sim something simple that folks can uh, apply to their situation, I think would be very valuable. Yeah, so maybe you could just tell them how many H100, whatever it is, cubic feet a month uh, or per billing period, this would um, factor out to for a one person, two person, three person household so people can see where their consumption falls right now. Yeah. And in terms of I time, can... oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, April. Oh, no, I, agree that I can share the one of the samples that was provided. Um, 
let's see, let me share my screen. So one of the samples that was provided attached to the staff report, and this is for residential for single family, but then we also do have attachments for commercial and for multifamily. So it does talk, um, it does lay out here how many gallons per day and where how the per person residential is actually determined. And then here it gives a little bit of a scenario, like a current per month 30 days water allowance based on household size. Um, and in this, I just kind of talk a little bit about this, and then obviously we refresh this to make it new and more more up to date. Um, but your current water bill is, ironically, the current water bill does show um, in the talk about the middle side of the, of the left. There's a chart. It's in there. It's a chart to graph, and it does show your water usage, and it does show the conversion into gallons right below where the water usage is. So it does have it on there. Ironically, we are converting, um, we're migrating over to cloud-based services for Springbrook, who does our module for our water use or for our utility billing, and the new bills will not do the conversion into gallons because right now we're paying for a custom, but it will show the unit. And so what we are going, what we're planning on doing with the conversion is have a little note in there that says one unit equals 748 gallons. So hopefully that will be an easy transition for them to make. But it is, the usage is currently reflected in your water bills in your water statement. And, and where are we in the billing cycle right now? A new bill will be going out approximately November 15th. We're finishing up. We're going to be doing the meter reads right now. And so we are including an insert in the November bill that will talk about the conversion and, and notate the gallons and the units. And then if, there, if the phase two does move through, we're also planning on including at least some type of brief informational item on phase two so we can easily incorporate that and show people where to look in their bill to see what their current consumption is. Great. And you. so from us tonight, uh, what you're looking for, what, what we're understanding is that we've, we've hit the trigger points for a phase two and that what you're looking for is the council to move it into this phase that would also uh, begin the advisory board. Is that where we are? Yes, um, it, would, it would, we would start the clock on, on getting the advisory, the recruitment for the advisory board to bring back uh, recruitment for, for council selection. Okay. Uh, I think I'm gonna uh, open it to, I'm not seeing any uh, other council comment. I'm gonna open it to public comment at this point and see if any, uh, we have, uh, if we have uh, anybody in public comment, uh, Priya. Yes, we do have someone in public comment. Um, uh, last name Wallach, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, okay, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself and speak and please state your full name. Okay, can you hear me? This is Richard Wallach, yep. 1660 Spring Street. I think I can respond to Mary Koberstein's question. Um, I've sat down and determined after reading your documents what I might have to do to stay in compliance. Uh, I'm okay during the winter uh, as long as I don't have to water anything. So one of the questions that came up to me was, uh, when does this go into effect? Because right now there's no rain forecast in November or first, first couple of weeks of November. So um, it would be very difficult to stay within the regulations in November because I need to continue. I don't have a lawn, but I do have trees, bushes and potted plants that are on drip. So I looked at the summer to try and determine from my previous year, what do I have to do? Uh, in order to stay in compliance with the regulations as posted, I would have to reduce my water consumption by 34%. If I don't do that, I would end up in the worst month with a $5,000 a month fine, which I think I understand we need fines. I understand we need to um, control this monster but $5,000 a month seems a bit excessive to get people's attention. So I would like the council and the upcoming water board to take a look at those rates and try and see if we can impact the thing, but still be reasonable. Um, so anyway, that's what I looked at. Um, I 
think it's all workable. The one thing that did concern me was there was a statement in one of the regulations that said that violation of the ordinance would result in a fine up to $500 per day. Um, not sure what that means. So I would like some clarification at some point down the road. Does that mean if one person turns on their sprinkler um, during the uh, during the winter season that they're subject to $500 a day fine. So those are my questions. We have time to work on them, but uh, I just thought I'd let you know that it's uh, going to mean pe most people are going to have to do something because I'm going to have to go 34% and I don't have a lawn. Uh, those who have a lawn are going to have to work harder. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the comments. Uh, um, I'm looking to see if there's more public comment. And um, at this time, I am not seeing any. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, close the public comment. I'll bring it back to council. I'm going to see, uh, I see Ms. Chateau's hand. Yes, I just have a couple questions. How does it work with our, the bi-monthly or the billing every two months? Would people get fine double, like for both months, and then they get notice? I'm not clear on how that works, and maybe that needs to be answered later, but I was curious about that. And then also, where what do we do with the fine money? Where does that go? So I can answer at least the, the bi-monthly billing question. Uh, what I would assume we would do, and we would still need to work it out internally, but currently we do we do, do meter reads every single month because we utilize those for doing the leak checks and seeing which leak alarms have been triggered. And so what we would do is we would be able to look at who's, who's exceeding what their daily usage is, or, you know, we, we truncate that into a monthly use. So what we would do at that time, we would actually evaluate that on a monthly basis. They would still get their bi-monthly bill, but their fines and penalties would be assessed on a monthly basis and they would be notified on a monthly basis. That is where, that's what I'm looking at because I, I don't think it'd be fair to wait two months and then tell somebody all of a sudden you have this massive fine. Plus that the first, um, under the structure we used before, the first notice was a warning with no fees and penalties attached to it. As far as the fines and penalties, they would just go into the actual water fund and it would go into a line item that we have for fines and penalties. Um, and it looks like Ethan, I don't know if you have any more further comments on the fines and penalties section. Sure, I, I just I just wanted to note that as, as April mentioned at the beginning, um, what you what you had in your ordinance previously is you had the vol volumetric um, fines to um, to account for uh, you know for for overages in in water usage, um, but those were taken out. I think in reaction to the San Juan Capistrano case um, because initially people just got nervous about what the implications of that case were. I think as people have taken more time and really looked at the issue carefully, they think those, um, those volumetric penalties are, are appropriate and allowable. So, so we, we would have to, I think April put in her timeline that, um, you know, we would have to bring uh, those fines back to you to be adopted. So they aren't actually in the in the code right now. So this is something that would be coming forward and these these issues that you're raising about the, you know, the equitable nature of them and the kind of comments that like like the uh, Mr. Wallach made um, are things you can take into account when you're considering what those fines should be. Um, and uh, and as he noted, you know, what we have in there currently is a uh, um, just kind of a, a general requirement that anything in violation of the um, the the phase two emergency restrictions is a, an infraction under your municipal code, and so that's subject to fines of up to five hundred dollars a day. That's a standard provision in your municipal code for any code violation. So that's and 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 that's kind of a blunt in, instrument to deal with. Uh, with issues like overages and fee uh, in in water usage, and that's why we would be coming back to you with fines that kind of address them in a more um, a more nuanced way, I guess. 
Mr. Knudsen. Another suggestion, given Mr. Wallach's um, very interesting statement is you could sort of say, maybe this is part of your analysis, Ms. Metz, is that you, you know if you don't reduce any water, this is what it would cost. If you reduce 5%, this is what it would cost. If you reduce 10%, this is what it would cost, et cetera, et cetera, so that people can get a sense of, you know, I remember back when we had the um, uh, power problems in the state of California where we all had to lower our electric usage or there were these rolling blackouts about 20 years ago. And guess what? We all figured out how to reduce our usage and, and many of us escaped, um, you know, the, the, the impacts were less than the, what the state was um, expecting. So maybe we can do the same thing. If we give people a good idea of what they might be facing, that we'll get those voluntary reductions um, across the board and therefore we'll manage through this crisis uh, together. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, other council comments? I've got a few comments, unless I'm seeing. Uh, as we look at this, and I think Mr. Wallach's comments uh, and, and some of the earlier, uh, you know, walking through the, the level of the fines, I think looking, you know, what's consistent, as we say, with best practice, if we're not looking in a vacuum, we're looking at what others benchmarking against other cities, so to speak, and, and seeing um, sort of where the practice is now, if these numbers uh, came from a, something that was established a number of years ago here, where's the industry, the, the, the conversation now as this has evolved. Um, you know, we have a, a system that's residential users, also very large industrial users on the same system. In a sense, we're all sharing the same water hole. So um, what are, models uh, that work so that we we can all get through this together. It's very challenging uh, with this primary resource. Um, so in terms of timeline, you would come back with, a, in a sense, proposals for what these fines might be. In the meantime, as we now move into the phase two, uh, is there a timeline for when that type of fining may begin? Do we have that established? That would be done at a subsequent meeting. So similar to what they did in 2014 is we would bring a, a proposed fine schedule or penalty schedule that we could obviously work with in the city council on. And at that time, the city council could adopt whatever the, the penalties and fines would be, as well as the timeline for the first month that that would be implemented. And, and so the expectations for the community, both the residential and business community about what's gonna happen now uh, as we determine a phase two water emergency, what, what's the expectation for the residents and businesses from now until that point when we come back to the, with those fines? I would defer to the municipal code on what they're supposed to be doing during this particular time. Uh, we can easily, you know, get together a flyer so we can send it out preemptively to let them know that we have entered into a phase two. This is what the requirements are. I um, mean, probably a good reminder because everything that was enacted in phase one is still applicable to phase two. So I can work with Erica and with her staff because I believe uh, Martine Beltran was the one who put together the first flyer that went out for phase one. And we would just continue that process working with Public Works. Okay. Any thoughts from uh, Ms. Chateau? Just that I heard Ms. Smithy say very clearly at the beginning that we're already in a phase two. So to me, it makes sense to, st keep, to declare that we are and to move forward with the process. Yes, I just wanna know a uh, clear indication to the community what that means in terms of what, what they can expect until we get this, this listing of fines back. So if, if you have a, something you can put together that that's simple and clear, that'd be great. And so, so with that, um, are you looking for a, a motion um, uh, declaring the phase two, Mr. Presswich? Yes. 
And do we have uh, somebody in the council who would like to uh, make that motion? Mayor, just to clarify, there there is actually a resolution attached that oh, you would I'm be sorry. adopting. Here we go. So with this resolution, do we have a, uh, a motion uh, on passing the resolution or any other comments or questions before that? Will there have to be another resolution that amends this resolution with respect to the penalty structure? Or it, it would not it would not amend this resolution. This simply declares the, the phase two emergency, but then we would have to come back with a resolution to, to adopt the fine schedule later. I'll move that we adopt this resolution. I second. And a roll call, please. Well, can we have a little more discussion? Yeah, if you'd like, yes. Um, one of the things that's missing in this discussion is sort of the the, the water. <laughs> you know, we've, we've kind of focused on the fines and focused on the future, but it would be helpful for our public and for me to get a better sense of, of how we are doing compared to years past with respect to the different mixes of water, the Napa water, what's available, uh, groundwater, how much we're extracting from the ground, and then the use of Bell Canyon to get some of those charts out and maybe do a little primer on that. I think that would be very helpful. Um, I agree that we should look to best practices, but our, our city is extremely unique in terms of the mix of water we use and compare it to maybe prior years, like maybe 2007 was a bad year, uh, to get a sense of where we are so people understand the history. Uh, this is not new for us. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion there on that part of it, what's available. Um, and then I think just, I think it makes, it needs to be very clear that folks can't irrigate. It, it's, it, we mentioned that, but it doesn't seem like that's explicit. Uh, during the months, I guess from November to, I, I guess it's what, April? Because uh, that's obviously a big use of water for residents. That's going to be painful for a lot of people. So we need to focus on that. But I just wanted to maybe uh, have you come back, Erica, in April to sort of, you know, help us, you know, the, the Safe Fuel Committee, obviously, I know they've been in contact with you and there's a lot of information out there. It, I find it very helpful when I get, receive that information from various constituents. And I think the public will be uh, well informed to receive a little bit more of that information too. Thank you. And I, I, I certainly support that. And I, I'm hopeful that this water advisory board can help collate that, you know, bring that information in so that, um, so that it's in a sort of a unified uh, approach. It's such a complicated subject, uh, water uh, uh, and how it's distributed. There's, I'll, I'll use a term uh, that makes it complicated. Uh, there's what's called wet water, which is the resource, the physical resource of water. And then there's paper water, which is the, uh, the, the contracts, the allocations, the, the, the way we, we pay for water, what's written. Um, and so sometimes that makes things uh, more complicated. So I'm looking at this advisory board as, as really key to helping uh, bring in all the different information we have about water in St. Helena, which is very unique. Uh, and then also tying that to overall best practices with the idea that water as a resource it's a physical resource with characteristics that are the same everywhere. For example, water naturally just flows down anywhere you are in the world. And so there's some things that are, that are, that are uniform with it, no matter how unique the situation. And so I think this advisory board can help really bring in uh, looking at our unique situation, but also tying it to overall best management. So I, I see that as a real value uh, because we do have a lot of information that's already been gathered that can be brought together. Is there any additional comment uh, discussion? And I so with that, I believe we have a motion and a second. If there's no additional comment, uh, I'll ask for a, uh, a roll call. 
Vice Mayor Doring? Yes. yes. Councilor Chateau? Yes. Hoberstein? Yes. Knutson? Yes. Mayor Eldra? Yes. And I've had a request for a, a bio break after this item. So uh, we will uh, take a break here for 10 minutes uh, and return at uh, 817 if that is uh, okay with the council. Okay, very good. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Folks are coming back in. Cindy, are you back? Okay. Seeing Mr. Presswich, I'm seeing the council. Everybody is here. So we'll get started. Um, I, there's been a request to hear items 11.1 .1 and 11.2 next. Uh, so if there's no objection from council, um, I'd like to do that. And then we'll finish on uh, the final item 10.4 uh, regarding the, um, uh, the public employees, employees and first responders uh, uh, item. So if uh, there's no the objection. Request. Who's making the request? I, uh, from this uh, city clerk had asked me. Okay. So if we can uh, move to item 11.1, .1, this is the quarterly grant report for fiscal year 2021, uh, quarter one for the period ending September 30th, 2020. And this is uh, prepared by Mandy Kellogg. Good evening. So this is the quarterly report for first quarter of fiscal year 2021, which is for the period ending September 30th. Um, next slide. During this quarter, we were awarded two new grants. The first one was in the amount of 65,000 for the LEAP grant, which is to complete the housing element update. We were also awarded the Upper Valley Waste Management grant in the amount of 120000 to replace a portion of waste and recycling carts on Money Way with three consolidated enclosures. Next slide. On this slide here, we have um, eight pending grant applications during this quarter, and I'm just going to give a brief update on the status of these, each of these applications. The first one is for the Bulletproof Best Partnership. That application is still pending approval. The next one is the home grant for the 963 Pope Street project. We did receive an initial score, which was within the required range, but we have not received a determination yet on the application. The next grant was the home grant for the housing rehabilitation program. And the city was just recently notified that we were awarded $500,000 for this program. The next one is for the CDBG housing rehabilitation program. The city did receive a denial due to a missing document in the application, but it's currently filing an appeal. They had a new system this year, which made it challenging to upload some of the documents. So um, Andrea with the Housing Authority is working on that appeal for the city. The next two grants, the Christine Apartments and the Hunts Grove parking lot, um, applications are still under review. However, it is unlikely that they'll be approved during the, this first round of funding, because at the time they were submitted, there was already 56 million in requests submitted and there's only 23 million available in funding. However, we can pursue these opportunities in the next funding cycle, which will open January of 2021. This next one, the business assistance grant, we did receive initial comments from CDBG on the application and are working with the representative at HCD for responses on the comments. And then the CDBG CB1 application is still under review. Next slide. Um, Erica gave a thorough um, update on the Upper York Creek restoration, so I don't need to give an update on that. Um, but as she stated, we will be moving forward with invoicing the granting agency. For the Friends and Foundation, we received our first allocation of 33750 in July. On um, the Caltrans um, HSIP grant, which is the guardrail replacement, design is approximately 50% complete, with Caltrans environmental reviews still remaining to be completed. The SB2 planning grant, we completed our first draw and it was approved by HCD in the amount of $54,000 and we should be receiving those funds shortly. Um, Public Works located a GSA company in early September and completed a site visit on September 30th for the emergency backup power and we're currently awaiting an updated scope of work for contract quotes. Next slide. Um, for the um, home grant, which is our current one that we've already had existing, we did receive a $26,000 payment on one of the loans, which will be allocated to another homeowner for a project. Next slide. 
Um, we have four projects pending from the fiscal year 1920 on the nonprofit grants. They were granted an extension to December 30th due to impacts from COVID. And then in fiscal year 2021, we executed 11 grant agreements and two of the granting agencies have requested reimbursements already. And that is it for my grant report. Thank you. Are there uh, questions or comments from council on the grants? I'm seeing none. I will open it to the public comment uh, to see if there are questions or comments. Ms. Nixon? I'm looking, I'm looking right now to see if there are any members of the public who'd like to do public comment to this item and I am not seeing any. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring it back to council. I had a question on the, the grants the, for the Christine Apartments and the Hunts Grove. Are there, are there other grants that can be looked at at the same time uh, for those projects? Um, I would probably need to do some further research on that. But like I said, they are opening up that same opportunity again in January. Um, they should be releasing the NOFA, they said, about um, January 27th. This is a very competitive process for that grant. Um, so we do want to make sure we're prepared for that when that's released, that we can submit our application right away. And, and then do do these grantors, do they require um, folks to only apply for a certain amount of, I mean, can you apply for numerous grants with one project or, or are they limiting the amount of grants you can put one project forward for? Yeah, the way that that particular opportunity um, works is there's several different categories that they have and you can only submit one application per category activity. Um, so we can actually submit multiple applications as long as they don't overlap in the same category. Mm, okay. Any other uh, questions or comments from council? Seeing none. Um, We'll move on now to item 11.2, and this is the fiscal year 20, 2021 uh, first quarter finance report. And this is all, uh, this is uh, Ms. Mitz, our finance director. <laughs> Great, thank you. So this is the first quarter finance report. This does reflect all transactions from July 1st through September 30th, 2020. If we look at our general fund revenue summary, you can see here, our, I have it broken down by category. So we have our property taxes, sales tax, TOT, other revenue, and then the total. So our adopted is 11 point, almost 2 million. Our adjusted is the same because we have not made any adjustments yet. And then the collected so far through September 30th is 1.3 million. So we have collected 12% of what our revenues are. This is on track just due to the timing of some of our payments. In particular, our TOT payments, so any uh, TOT that was collected in September is not due until October 30th, so that is not going to be reflected in TOT, as well as at the time we published this report, sales tax, the 440000 only reflects sales tax numbers through July. We had not yet received, received our, July, our, our August numbers. Um, we did confirm yesterday on the next slide. Um, that we did receive our August numbers for sales tax. So I wanted to provide this update to the city council that wasn't part of the actual staff report. And so here you can see per fisc um, for the current fiscal year for sales tax, what we did is we assumed 30% of the prior year revenues due to COVID-19. So that's for sales tax and measure D. And then for TOT, we assumed 10% of the prior year revenues. So for July, our estimated was 86,000 for sales tax. We actually took in 274,000, so it's a lot higher. So the net difference positive over what we expected to collect was 187,000. Same thing for Measure D, we had 49,000 we projected. We collected 149,000. Difference is positive, 100,000, almost 101,000. And then TOT is the same. We have 32,000 was our estimated. 95,000 was the actual, and then the difference being 662,000. And so the net difference that we're over what our estimates are is almost 351,000. So that is great news for July. August, uh, since it was available yesterday, I did add in what our actual sales tax was for our sales tax and measure D. And so again, you can see we're definitely trending net positive in those two areas. 
What's been recorded for August is 60,000 over what we expected for TOT. And so our collection over our estimates is $343,000. So that is definitely good news. We are very happy to see that. However, we know that the winter months are coming. And if we do have a second, a second strain of COVID that comes through, we definitely want to keep our very conservative assumptions. September, we will not have that information until November for sales tax. And then again, here, the TOT, at the time we actually ran the report, we only had $2,500 collected, but they do have until the end of this month to make their TOT payments. So I did want to provide council a brief update on those, those numbers. As far as our overview of our expenditures for the general fund, so you can see um, there are two departments that does, we are on track for our spending just a little bit over in one of the departments, and that is fire where we're at 52%. Typically you wanna have anything above 75% available in these categories. However, non-departmental, that's where we make our additional unfunded PERS liability payments. So it is typical that you will see this decrease in the first quarter, so we're on track there. The other area just to bring, um, you know, just to make you aware of is, is fire in particular, but then also it did reflect affect the police department as well. These numbers reflect additional hours that were done due to strike teams, as well as overtime for the LNU fire and then for some earlier fires that were captured in payroll. This does not include any of the overtime that was captured for the recent glass fire, um, but also a lot of those expenditures are going to be reimbursable um, through the strike team pay. And so what we will do at our mid-year budget review, we'll bring the offsetting expenses and the offsetting revenues to you. So that will actually increase our expenses, um, our, our expenses in both of these departments, but it will also be offset by revenue. So I wanted to make you aware of that. For our general fund net position, this is the same net position that we forecasted um, when we adopted the fiscal year 21 budget. We have not made any changes to this. We're anticipating we will make the changes at the mid-year budget review once we know more of what our overall strike team costs are. Additionally, we know we do have uh, costs for COVID-19 as well as um, other expenses due to the glass fires. We are hoping to get reimbursement for most, if not for most of the, those expenses, with the exception of the potential city contribution of, I believe, the 6.25%, as our city manager had mentioned earlier. But for right now, we are looking at our net position at 41%, and that will be updated during the, uh, the mid-year budget. For the water fund, for the revenues, we're at $1.4 million, just short of $1.4 million. We are at 20% collected, and that is lower than anticipated. Typically, by this time, we're about 23% collected. When we looked at the analytics for the water fund, the primary uh, classification that was down on water consumption was for general commercial, which would coincide with the effects of COVID-19 and having general commercial not not being as open as they have in the past. Our expenses right now are at 1.6, almost 1.7 million, which is 27%, and we are on target for this particular, for our expenses. Uh, we are going to be wa watching both the water and the wastewater revenues uh, to know if we need to make any adjustments by the mid-year budget review. And the mid-year budget, if we do make adjustments, if we keep trending downward on our revenues due to lower consumption within certain classifications. What we will look for on the other side of it is actually looking where we can cut expenses. So we can make sure that we balance the expenses and the revenues and not have to take from our fund balance for both the water and the wastewater funds. Because we do know that uh, with some of the critical projects that are coming on board, we know that we need to be able to use some of that fund balance to go towards those projects. Here's an overview of the expenditures, so you can just see where they're at by department and what the funding is available. Again, the only one that is showing really low is right here in the non-departmental. And again, that has to do with the outline of your PERS unfunded liability during the first quarter of the year. So even though it does show low, we are showing on track for that particular fund. 
The water fund balance estimate, this again is the same that we presented when we adopted the budget. So we are showing at 76% and that includes transferring out $540,000 for capital. But we do also know that there are other water projects that are coming online that we will be utilizing some of this net position for. For the wastewater fund, so our overview is our revenues are at 566, almost 577,000. Uh, that is 70, 17% collected. At the same time last year, we're at 18% collected. So again, it is only 1% difference, but it is lower than what we anticipated for this time frame. And in this particular category, it was we had restaurants, we had hotels, general commercial, and industrial. Those are the four areas that were uh, that had a decrease in our wastewater consumption, and that is that is directly tied to the water consumption because for anything non-residential, when we do the wastewater billing, it's a one for one. So every one unit of water they use, we bill them for one unit of wastewater, unlike the residential where it's billed on winter average. So that is where we saw the decrease in consumption for the wastewater fund. Our expenses are at 398,000, which is 28%, which we are on target for our expenses in the wastewater fund. If we look at the expenses by department for wastewater fund, again, everything is showing on track. Um, attorney's budget, you won't see anything in there because there's a little bit of a lag time with the timing of the invoices. And again, non-departmental non is at 26%, and it has to do with the timing of the, um, the PERS unfunded liability payments. Uh, wastewater fund balance and net position, uh, again, it's the same as what we presented at the adopted budget, so we are showing at 97%, but this does also include that $1.1 million from the settlement agreement that will be moved over into the CIP projects for the wastewater treatment plant. This is something that typically is not in the quarterly report, but I know we reported on it for our Q4 unaudited. And I think it is very important for you to, to recognize what's going on in the water wastewater aging analysis. And so I'm going to, during, especially during this COVID time right now, not knowing if that's the reason why people may, may be delayed in paying their water and wastewater bills, but you'll see from the same time frame last year, so from two, September 30th, 2019, if we look at our aging report for uh, delinquencies, 30 to 60 days, 60 to 90 days, 90 to 120 days, and then over 120 days, you can definitely see where the same time frame last year, we were much lower. And this, for the same time frame this year, you can see that we are trending much higher in our delinquency on our water and wastewater utility billing. For our CARES leak adjustments, um, so for the CARES program and the leak adjustments, so we did have 99, 99 participants in the CARES rate program. We have only had one additional participant since the start of COVID. Uh, the subsidy from July 1st to September 30th was $12,973. As far as the leak adjustments, we did have 13 leak adjustments. Um, it is important to note that during phase one, we are not to be granting any leak adjustments. However, the 13 that were granted, this was for water use in May and June, so it was prior to activation of the phase one uh, water, rest uh, water restrictions. So the subsidies from July 1st to September 30th was 3,200, and the leaks were for May and June that were actually billed in July. And so the council action tonight is to receive and file this report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I had a question before I uh, ask the council. It, do the Measure T funds this year, um, are they included? Uh, where are they included? And are they, do we have a, a gauge of how they look uh, as compared to last year? The Measure T funds are included in the staff report, but not actually in this particular, uh, this particular PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I know the Measure T funds are lower from what we received so far due to COVID-19, less driving, uh, less sales tax members coming in than what we had initially anticipated from last year. And so I can, I can provide the update for city council on that at a future meeting where I can get it together and actually, actually do the analysis on what we expected and where we're at on target, you know, if we're on target or not. Great. Yeah. It would just be interesting to see that and how it uh, compares to other years just to, to see the impacts. Uh, so uh, any questions or comments from council? I'm seeing Ms. Chateau with a hand. 
Question, do you have any idea why the sales tax was better than expected? Any trends that emerged or where people are spending money? I literally, I just got the report today from Avenue. So they are, they're the organization that actually runs our sales tax projections for us, as well as puts together the comprehensive reports. So the report that I just received in my inbox today is for Q2 of the calendar year. So it's April, May, it's any sales tax for April, May, and June. Uh, so I have not had a chance to go through that information yet, and that will give us more of an idea for that particular quarter where the spending was at. So we can see if it was more online orders, if it was, you know, people shopping, you know, it, it, that will give us a lot more indication on where the spending actually happened and in which category. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Knudsen. Yeah, hey, I, I love spreadsheets because I started my career uh, <clears throat> just as Lotus123 was starting. So, um, Ms. Mitz, uh, in the, it, for the next one, it'd be really interesting to see sort of typical, you know, as you're sort of moving through the year, typical amount collected this year collected, typical amount spent this year spent. So, you know, let's just um, compare sort of what we, ex you know, like the difference versus the the uh, projections, yeah, interesting, but I'd rather see sort of the absolute, it, our march through the year as we march through the year as we move up to 100% or 95% or 105%. It's like sort of how are we doing based on where we need to be would be really, really helpful. Because I know that TOT never comes in until October, so it's always going to be low. But, you know, normally we get 10% of it or 15% or at any rate, it'd be really interesting to see sort of that progression um, through, ta through, the, through the fiscal year. Um, uh, in the future, but thank you very much. It looks like we're it, considering what we've had to do. We seem to be in reasonable shape and um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, very good. So this is a receive and file document uh, or these uh, documents. Um, are there any other questions or, or comments from council before we, we move forward? Seeing none, thank you very much for the reports. And um, we will now move to our final item uh, this evening. And this is, uh, let me get to my agenda here. We're gonna go back to item 10.4. And this is uh, the city council, city, uh, city clerk, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, but did you call for public comment? I don't think I did. I, uh, so I will go back to uh, the previous item. Uh, we were discussing 11.2 and I will open it for public comment. All right, I'm looking to see if there is any public comment, anyone with a raised hand and I am not seeing any. Very good. Well, I will bring it back. I will close the public comment and uh, we'll close that item and uh, <clears throat> We've given direction for the, excuse me, the receive and file. And we'll move now to our final item. And that is item 10.4. Uh, and this, excuse me. This is city council discussion and direction regarding acknowledgement and appreciation of the city's public employees and first responders for their long hours and hard work <clears throat> undertaken during the glass fire emergency. Um, the background on this is uh, at the October 13th, 2020, 20 regular city council meeting, council member Koberstein recommended in the wake of the glass fire, the city council recognized the city's public employees and first responders for their long hours and hard work that was undertaken for the city of St. Helena. Council member Koberstein also requested to agendize a discussion for the city council to discuss and consider other distinguishing recognition ideas. Uh, that was uh, something I certainly supported and I, I know other council members did as well. Um, so uh, the discussion uh, begins uh, with these pr uh, proposed ideas from uh, Ms. Koberstein. Uh, would you like to take us through them and sort of introduce us to the ideas that we can discuss? You know, the reason this got agendized was because I, I learned from our city attorney that we couldn't really plan a celebration with, without violating the Brown Act. So um, I don't think that I need to lead this discussion. Um, this is here for people to react to and indicate. Um, and, and I noticed that 
both Chief Sorensen and Hartley hung on till the bitter end here, maybe to talk about a parade, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't intend to be the leader of this discussion. Um, you know, I'd like to hear from the whole council of what people think is most appropriate for us to do. Okay, very good. So with that, what I can do is we can open it up if, if some council members have some thoughts about ideas that they like, or we can go through each item and get folks take on each separate item. Uh, any preference how we go forward? Okay, uh, we'll, why don't we start? We'll just kind of work down the list and then get folks takes uh, on, on each separate item. So we'll start with uh, the commission of a large plaque that will be on public display in order to memorialize the thoughts and feelings as a community. Rather than place it on a building, Council Member Coverstein suggested the city install the plaque downtown as a part of the sidewalk project, perhaps at Hunt and Main, where for generations to come, it will remind residents and visitors of our common experience and our resiliency. Any initial thoughts from Council? Well, I, I certainly support this type of legacy installation. Um, it recognizes a moment in time, uh, but it also you know, can serve as an inspiration uh, for everybody in this town moving forward. And, and when we read that proclamation, one of the things that stands out is that it talked about city employees who risked their lives for us as a community. It's, it's hard to even put into words how moving uh, that statement is. And so to me, memorializing what happened, what we wanna inspire future members of our community, of, of our employees, the, the levels to which um, we, uh, this community came together and the employees stood with this town. I'm certainly in favor of, of something uh, to memorialize uh, this, this incident, but with the idea that it, 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 it talks about the resiliency of the town and the employees and how we, we work together through these things. Any, any thoughts? Well, I will add, I, I like this particular idea. I think it was decades from now, it'll be seen maybe as a historic moment. Um, in St. Helena. And um, I, I think having something permanent to commemorate it is a good idea. What it's what it looks like or what it says, I think would be up to some smaller group uh, to work on designing it and maybe work with our streetscape uh, consultant about placement or whatever. Because it really is so remarkable that it, it's a compound multi-level emergency response, uh, COVID, uh, a previous fire and a recovery, and then the glass fire. And so a, a recognition, I think, uh, of, of that extraordinary situation, uh, I think uh, I think it makes sense. Um, and so is it an idea of creating a, a subcommittee? Uh, as, so as we go, why don't we go through these? Um, there may be some uh, synergy in terms of, of how to Put this together. Uh, so, is there is there council support for some this idea of a of a, of a plaque or a display? Um, and perhaps as the as the Hunt Street Hub comes together, uh, they'll it'll sort of materialize where something could happen in that area. Um, any th other thoughts from council on this item, Ms. Chateau? I like the idea. The part that I'm struggling with is just that we continue to have these warnings and feel like we're not through fire season or even the emergencies yet. So I think I just have this feeling like we don't know what's coming yet still. So I love the idea of honoring it, um, but I don't know where you put it. And also I just stay open to that, that we don't know, you know, every year we're hit with more and more threats. And this has been a year where we've had one thing after another. So I just keep that in mind. Yes, yes. Uh, but I, I do think the recognition of resiliency is timeless. Um, and, and I agree, we don't know what's coming next. So we wanna make sure we keep our eyes on that. 
Um, okay, so if we if we think about that and consider that, um, and then the next one is placing a banner across Main Street during Employees Week. Uh, any council thought on this? I'll go. This is I like yeah, yeah, please do show. I think they're great. I like banners, but also, I mean, I really liked the parade idea. So, you know, do we need it all? Do, do we pay for it all? I don't know. If we go down this list one by one, I can say what I like, but if we're going to prioritize, I'd pick out a couple of other ones. Okay. Um, is there a way, uh, certainly the banner could be tied in with the uh, parade. Um, is there a way to prioritize, uh, Mr. Knudsen? The best event this past year, one of the best events was the high school graduation bike parade. Let's do a bike parade. Um, among other things, it's can wind through the community. Everybody can get involved. People can ride their bikes. Um, I inclusive stuff. Uh, I'm just I'm just throwing it out. Um, I'm I'm atta I'm attached to doing good things to foster community. So whatever it is, but uh, uh, I don't think we need to go through these one by one. Let's have a collectively uh, endorse the the city manager to make something happen. Uh, for us, but I think we should do a little bit of let's do some free associating and and um, come up with some really great ideas. The bike, the graduation, the high school graduation, that was a special event, really great. That, that was, and I think it respected the COVID protocols and that you know we were able to do something that was a group thing, but it had the the distance. Is it is it worth um, the consideration of a subcommittee coming together? working with Mr. Prestwich to sort of bundle these and see what might be a good way to system, systematically roll something out. Ms. Coberstein, what, what would you think about that if you were to lead a, a group with one other council member and Mr. Prestwich to sort of... Well, I don't want to put more work on the staff while we are trying to honor them. <laughs> well, I can. I would certainly be happy to, to work if you would like to work together on, on trying to put together a a menu sort of, of of what this would look like. I think we should figure out what we want to do. I, the time for ordering and actually designing and getting a banner across Main Street by November 8th is growing very slim. Um, so if, if that was something we wanted to do, um, it needs to be done fairly quickly. But um, it doesn't seem like we need to assign somebody to work on this plaque right away. I think the there is a I think the bike parade sounds good. They're the uh, first responders indicated they might uh, be willing to do a parade maybe on uh, the weekend, a Saturday. Um, I don't know how they coordinate that with us and the community. Maybe they could address that. Or Andre, you you helped with the, um, the parade that took place on the 4th of July. Maybe what kind Andre, of- Are you there with us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yep. What, what kind of logistics are involved to pull off like the bike parade and a first responders parade? Uh, for your parks and recreation staff, it's fairly simple. So it wouldn't take a lot for us to, to pull something together. Just a little bit of time. It'd be nice to have you know, uh, three to four weeks to be able to plan and, and mostly get the word out so that we get good participation and then hope for good weather. So if, if a banner was put up and then also a parade was planned and then also something perhaps in conjunction with the parade having to do with a, a, a food event or some sort of culinary event so that it could all be tied into one, one day of a parade and a culinary event and then have the banner up early to, to sort of recognize it, does that start to groups? And, and the gratitude wall could be less permanent than the plaque, so that could be perhaps included in, you know, at the same time as the parade um, and that where, where people could express their feelings and emotions. And then, then we look at something more long-term like the plaque, uh, uh, permanent plaque, that could be a little bit further down the road. I think it would be nice to be able to do at least one of these things during the week that we have designated as city employees uh, week, which is a week of November 8th. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that we need to have the bike parade and the 
first responders parade on, at the same time. And maybe I'll ask uh, the chiefs if what's involved on your end, if, if that's possible to be done during that week. I know it's still fire time for you, Chief Sorensen, so I'm not sure what the availability is for a parade. It's, uh, it, it, and until it rains, it's uh, up in the air. The PD, we're, we're fairly flexible uh, at the moment. Uh, a Saturday would work. Um, I'd like, I don't know about outfitting everybody with bicycles or if everybody has a bicycle, but um, that, I mean, I'm all for it. The more, the more that we can interact with the community, especially now, um, the better. So, so if, and I get what you're saying, uh, Ms. Koberstein, that we don't want to ask the staff who we're honoring to have to work so hard to put it together, but is it worth having a coordination meeting in the next couple of days to just look at a calendar to at least see when things might work out um, scheduling wise, Chief? Does that sound like a, a, a maybe a next step? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally good with that. And, and Andre, how is your availability? I can be available um, Friday afternoons are a little, little tough because of a conflict I have, but other than that, I'm available anytime. Okay. Uh, Ms. Koberstein, would it, how would it sound if, if uh, four of us got together and just kind of looked at a calendar and see if we could lay out some timing and then build around that? Oh, I, the, the mute, Mary, the mute. I, I think that's fine. Uh, one thing on the list and talking with Chief Sorensen later, the drive through lobster feed doesn't seem like it would happen now. It would probably happen at the normal time that the lobster feed happens. Um, and um, maybe I would ask Cindy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we had some conversations about this gratitude wall and you had a couple suggestions for that, how that might happen. So I've had a breakthrough today and I found out who resurrected the wall. And so I'm just going to be reaching out to that person and seeing what they did and if we can copy. So it was actually not, um, oh, I can't, I'm drawing a blank, the art studio downtown or the other end of town. It wasn't them, it was somebody else. So I can report back to you tomorrow. There were two ideas here. One was to just um, put those easels back up in front of the police station and um, get, get some pens and whatever and let people know that they could come out and write whatever they wanted to write um, to the city employees, the fire department, the police department. <clears throat> but then uh, Cindy uh, remembered the um, the wall that was on the uh, Vasconi side, um, which I think it was right around the end of the year. It was something about uh, what are you thinking about in the, the next year or what are you hoping for? Um, and that could be um, something we could look into that would be a little more artistic maybe, but I, I still think just letting people come and write whatever they wanna write on the, uh, on the easels might be simple and heartfelt, I don't know. Uh, Anna, Ms. Chateau. I think it would be great to also have the proclamation up so that people could get to experience what we've experienced tonight when we read it and we see everything that we went through and that everybody did because it might get lost what the public work staff did or all of the staff that, and what, how their roles shifted and what they actually did and how hard they worked through the emergency. Not everybody knows that and they won't know it. And if it's up, they'll have more of a chance to know more of what happened. And then in, in terms of the banner, uh, Andre, is that something that, that you've worked with before getting banners and, and have a, uh, a place that you go for those if if um, 
if somebody wanted to work on a design, is that something that you believe could get pulled off by Mary? Well, actually, um, Jody is kind of on standby if we right. decide to do this. Um, she said she could, you know, with a little artwork, produce one in sort of a relatively quick time frame and maybe actually get it up during the week of November 8th. So if somebody wants to take responsibility for it and just design something fun, um, you know, anybody who wants to jump in. Sure. I, I know somebody who, who could handle the, the artwork. She's probably smiling right now. <laughs> That's great. Great. Be happy to. Thank you. I just have to ask the city manager how we pay for something like that. Um, we have excess money in our council fund that we can, I, th I think the banner is about 13 or $1,400, something like that. You have a couple of line items in your budget that total about $10,000 that was allocated to trainings and meetings this year that will not be used because of COVID. And so uh, you have a few dollars that could be reprogrammed. Great. Yep. Could we, um, also uh, use that for the um, um, uh, some sort of culinary celebration for our employees. And do we want to talk about that when we're talking about our, our calendar and just kind of look at what might work calendar wise? Anna? Uh, with the culinary celebration, since we can't all gather in groups, I like the idea of giving gift cards to employees so that they could go to GOTS or the station or Model Bakery or wherever it is um, when it worked for their schedule. Only in the Napa Valley do we have culinary celebrations. <laughs> Where I come from, we call it a potluck, but that's good. We can't really do that. I agree with all of these things. Okay, so if if as some next steps, uh, we're looking at the banner, uh, we're looking at a, a meeting in the next day or so uh, to talk about timing, um, and I can I can put out an email uh, to get that that conversation started, and then I think that'll help us start to shape how these these things come together. Does that sound satisfactory? It's all good. Okay. I'm okay. happy to participate. If anybody wants to contact me on any of these things, to the extent I have time, I would certainly do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other council comment or thought at this point? I, I, I've got to open it up to public comment. I'm sorry. Uh, is there any public comment? Um, I'm looking and I am not seeing any public comment. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mary, Ms. Koberstein, for bringing this forward. Thank you to our staff, uh, the employees who uh, this is intended to recognize the outstanding work that's just it's just ongoing, uh, remarkable. So, so we want to thank you. Um, and so, this is our final item of the evening. If there's no additional comment or or, or additional information. Um, then I will say thank you to everybody. I'll remind folks we're still in a you know, fire season. Stay calm and alert, stay uh, focused. We still have the COVID protocol, uh, but we're getting through this together as a community and thank, thank you everybody. And we'll adjourn the meeting and see you uh, at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you.